Hello and welcome to Kingdom in Context. I'm Sean. Tonight we're going to be picking up our 42 series. This one is all about the impossible spell. And we're going to talk about just um, how impossible it is, as well as uh, break down the history, the scriptures, modern day events, culture, entertainment, all of it's included. Hopefully you're enjoying this series. I want to give a big shout out to everyone that's already in the live chat. Uh, thank you, moderators, for helping us keep a decent and orderly live chat so people can focus and enjoy, hopefully, the presentation. Um, also, Guys, if you want to, you can help support us on our Patreon as well as other options in the video description below. The $20 tier on Patreon gets you early access to our contextual study guide that we've been working on. Um, just sent some uh, book off to um, the editor. So we're going to be adding more of those, be announcing the release of more of those just real quick and um, here in the next couple of weeks. I'm excited about that. We're working hard on those. Um, and uh, we are excited for tonight. I've been working hard on this presentation tonight. So tonight, uh, we'll be picking up where we left off last time we talked about the labyrinth. This is also going to be an extenuation of that idea, but even deeper level. So, um, and I don't say that in any kind of braggadocious way. That's just the reality of the information. So I want to thank you guys for being here. And uh, hopefully this is something that you're getting a lot of in information that's uh, helpful to you to understand the context of scripture. Also, before, uh, without further ado, I just want to Tell everyone, be sure to download our Kingdom in Context app. So we have the app here. You can get notified of videos when we go live. We have a fellowship finder. You can find other like-minded believers in your area. You may have saw the commercial at the beginning of this. It's free. It's on the Apple Store or the Google Play. It doesn't cost anything to use any of the features on the app. They're all free. And um, and in the future, once we finish our contextual study guide, we'll have it available on the app as well. So that's why we're, it's all a big work in progress. Thank you guys for your support. Everyone that's been donating to us, that helps us keep going and keep doing this. You guys are amazing. Thank you so much. And uh, I'm just excited for tonight. Hopefully you guys are too. So let's see here. Without further ado, let's see if we can get this presentation started tonight. We have the Zeit, the Krieg, erklärt. God, the Krieg, erklärt. We erschaffen eine neue Welt. Ohne Zeit. Ohne Gott. And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change time and law. As for you who forsake the Lord, and forget my holy mountain, who spread a table for fortune, and fill bowls of mixed wine for destiny, I will destine you for the sword. All 
Okay. Impossible Spell. This is part 17 of our 21-part series. Remember, we're counting down to number one. So we have a, we're on our way down to number one, and this is all about the 42 months leading up to the um, the return of Christ. And so this is we're going over the eschatology, all the pertinent information, and let us pull up our presentation and get rolling. So, so in case you're not understanding, or in case it's your first time watching us, uh, or if you just need a reminder, this series is about the 42 months leading up to the second coming of the Messiah, Jesus, the son of Nazareth. Revelation 13, 4 and 5, they worship the dragon who had given authority to the beast, and they worship the beast, saying, who is like the beast and who can wage war against it? The beast was given a mouth to speak arrogant and blasphemous words and authority to act for 42 months. This is a huge claim. And we are, we're, this is something that we, we just try to draw people's attention to. There's so much different, so many different people's opinions on eschatology and timelines. We try to remind them that the words in the book already tell us how long the tribulation period, which is a persecution against saints, how long that time is going to be when the beast whom the whole world worships after when he's going to be uh, quote unquote revealed. And he only has authority for 42 months to do certain things. And he's under the authority of Ra. We've been breaking this down. This is a part of this ancient Greek, Egyptian, and Hindu trinity. To the Hindus, he's called Brahma. Uh, Anubis, which is the second beast in Revelation 13, is the equivalent um, of Vishnu, or Anubis, to the Egyptians, or Hermes to the Greeks. And then the main beast, who the second beast promotes and makes people worship, he would be the one referred to as Apollo to the Greeks or Osiris to the Egyptians or to the Hindus, the representation of Shiva, where Shiva would be, quote unquote, one of his avatars. We're going to talk about various avatars of Shiva tonight since we are talking about time travel and multiverses. And people, a lot of people wonder, like, well, how in the world? I've never read that in the Bible. How could that possibly have anything to do with the Bible? Surprisingly, there's some interesting stuff to talk about in relation to this. So. I'm excited and I want to thank everyone here that's ready to join me. Let's jump into this. So many of you probably noticed in the past, what, 100 years, we've had countless stories and TV, film, comic books, all kinds of, of, of stories and different media forms represented to us for time travel or the manipulation of time and events. So many of you may remember some of these famous movies in the past 20 to 30 years. Time Cop, he stands beside this or behind excuse me, he's standing at least on the poster of these. Even on the poster, it shows you a lot of stuff that's that's interesting. Um, I didn't have time to go through each movie and all the different symbols that are inputted in each movie, but even on the poster, it shows you he's standing in front of something peculiar. Keep that shape and that frame in mind. Um, same thing with the famous movie from the early 80s, The Final Countdown. Ship goes back in time, goes through a portal to go back in time. Men, Men in Black uh, number three. Um, not only is there a trilogy on the front, but they're standing in front of something we're going to be talking about towards the end of this presentation. That's a representation of manipulation of time. Flight of the Navigator, a movie that I watched when I was a little kid in the 80s. Um, this peculiar ship that's actually actually the shape of an ancient Vimana. Um, and there's this artificial intelligence that is running the ship. We've actually talked about this, but inside his little uh, eyeball, his little uh, eyeball to show you he's got a life force in there of artificial intelligence. Uh, resembles something we'll be talking about throughout this throughout this presentation. Source Code uh, was a movie that came out in the early 2000s. Jake Gyllenhaal about you know being able to time travel to to change events, and this one directly has the word source in it. That has great implications to what we're actually going to be discussing today, and we, as we delve into the uh, how the ancient world viewed the creation, the fabric of reality, the manipulation of time. Yes, this is even from the ancient world. Um, Dr. Strange, he even has the symbol in his little, uh, magical, magical red thing that pops up in front of his hand when he starts doing his spells, he even has some of the temples symbols of re directly related to the manipulation of time that the ancient gods boasted about in his little necklace. He wears, I don't remember what it's called the eye of something, but it's a, basically the, the stone that allows him to manipulate time or time travel. The uh, this re more recently, like last year, two years ago, I can't remember, but there's an, the second Doctor Strange movie came out called The Multiverse of Madness, where 
not only is he standing in front of the same type of object, the circular type of object, which has implications later, you've got the chimeras involved in this, you've got uh, magicians battling and sorcery, you've got multiple dimensions being referenced and accessed. This is directly related to what we're going to be talking about tonight, not just time travel and the manipulation of time, but jumping into different universes, quote unquote, different levels of creation, different versions of creation. This is not new information. Tenet, popular movie, came out a couple of years ago. Extremely loud soundtrack. You can barely hear some of the some of the scenes, people talking. The uh, traditional movie poster is on the left, and it's uh, and it shows you the inversion um, of the world because this time travel is greatly involved in this movie. But then on the right is an artistic simplified version that that Christopher Nolan released for Tenet, and he's actually got the symbol of the Shiva and the Shakti. And this is where uh, I'm going to explain these two triangles that point up and down and what their meanings are. Uh, as we progress. So do not leave. Stay here. It may be a lengthy presentation. Come back. If you need more time, come back on a different on a different day even and just finish it. Don't don't miss as I explain all these things, but I have to set up so you understand by the time we get to the end and we talk about the presentations that they're openly speaking in public about this, um, you'll understand where all this comes from and you won't be deceived by this deception popular movie that came out 2014 2013 maybe called looper and uh, this one was one where time traveling bruce willis um had to you know he had to face the future and fight the past right so this is always what these movies are about they're always about correcting a wrong or preventing something bad from happening in the future keep that in mind that is the theme of what we're discussing when it comes to accessing something like a multiverse through advanced physics or what they claim anyway, or time traveling. It's never about creating positive, beautiful outcomes. It's always about the possibility of staving off some sort of judgment. And I'm going to plant that, that statement as a seed for you to let grow as we finish un unpacking this presentation to understand where it leads. Because this, and even the symbolism in this one, I mean, come on guys, it's literally that we'll be talking about the eye of Ra. Uh, Mother Babylon, you got the symbolism all right there. Um, so most of you that have been watching Investigating Babylon series, as well as the other four installments of this series, you probably already recognize that symbolism right off the bat. Um, in this movie, in Looper, when Bruce Willis gets into this time traveling machine, the entire casing inside of him is this uh, grid-like pattern that's all around him. That is not by accident. It looks like a stupid, a stupid cage even though it's not completely all around him, it's just on the sides. So even like if you're doing set design on a movie and you'd be thinking, well, that's kind of inconsistent. Why are you just putting it there and over there? Like that doesn't, I don't understand this. Yeah. It's, it's, it's intentional. And we're going to show you what this particular grid pattern has to do with this topic because it's replete. It's consistent without all this symbolism and all these movies, all these representations. There was a movie called Wanted came out in the mid 2000s, early 2000s. Uh, uh, Angelina Jolie, as well as um, the guy that played Professor Xavier. I can't remember his name right now. Um, and it was about assassins and he was being recruited to become an assassin. And part of the storyline was they uh, the Morgan Freeman character introduces him at, uh, to this loom of fate with this loom had all these strings that it was putting onto this. And, and it shows him at like a flashback of the history of the loom with all these cloaked robed dudes looking all ominous like a cult sitting around the around the loom and he explains how the looms predicting the future as well as finding the targets for their assassination and it's in this massive room with this grid like pattern on which the loom is going on to for the strings of people's lives that go on to the loom of fates this is all extremely intentional i remember when i watched this movie I laughed. I was in the theater with some friends. I laughed out loud because I was like, this is the dumbest thing I've ever seen. Like I thought, you know, already it was a dumb movie because they're bending bullets, like bend it around the card. If I just sling my arm super fast, I can shoot and bend this bullet around a car, around a pole, around the corner and hit, and hit my target. Cause I'm the ultimate assassin that can, that can bend 1600 mile an hour bullets and um, just the dumbest thing. First of all, the movie was so impractical. I was already out of it. Like my my disposition, my suspension of disbelief was already broken immediately at the moment they started bending bullets. Um, and and then it got to the actual motivation for the characters and explained the plot. So this loom of fate and how this is what chose the actual targets for whom they were going to assassinate. 
And I was like, gosh, this is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. There's like, there's like this weird mystical aspect that they, that has no true background story. But then it got worse because it showed like they would take the loom of fate and run their finger across the threading. And that's how they would interpret a binary code to then decipher into somebody's name. And I'm like, if this ain't the dumbest. So we're actually going to watch a stupid little clip and hopefully we won't get pulled down um, from this, from this movie about the loom of fates. <laughs> oh man. The, the things, the things in this stuff is, it's hilarious. We call this the loom of fate. So because it's like a, a one minute clip, I might pause it periodically just so we don't get any problems with YouTube playing copyright content. After today, you will never set foot in here again. Why not? Because like an apostle, you are... So take notice, he just used the word apostle. You've got the square and the compass signs on top of the loom. We're going to talk about that later. Task is not to interpret, but to deliver. Every culture in history has a secret code. Every culture in history, okay. <laughs> One you won't find in traditional texts. You mean like a source code? A thousand years ago, a clan of weavers discovered a mystical language hidden in the fabric. They called themselves the fraternity. I'll be honest with you, all I see are threads. Come here. Look there. You see that one thread that missed the weave and lies on top of the others? Well, like a mistake? No, it's a code. If the vertical thread is on top, it's a one. If it's below, it's a zero. So hopefully no one's going to start highly inspecting your laundry. This is obviously fictional nonsense. It's a visual metaphoric representation of their occult beliefs. So there's no true, don't, don't start going equal letter distant Bible code deciphering on your laundry at home. Just, just chill. Just, <laughs> this is just a fanciful depiction of their occultic beliefs. What does it say? It's a name. Target. Where do the names come from? Come out of a necessity, Wesley. A necessity to maintain balance in the world. They are it's always about maintaining balance, right? It's always about them being able to. We're going to talk about that later. So there's a ton of trigger words in here for what they believe. Our orders that must be executed, entrusted to us so that we might forge stability out of chaos and there's the he actually said both words but they switched them around they played a little game he said oh the orders entrusted to us that we might forge stability out of chaos which the typical mantra for the occult is to develop order out of chaos so yeah they, they got all the words in there this one is yours i don't I thought you brought me here to kill Cross. You will? In time? This is your first assignment. The loom provides. I interpret. You deliver. You want me to kill Robert Dean Darden? All right. So even in that little moment where he gives the three, the three steps, the loom provides, he interprets and the trigger man delivers. We're going to talk about that representation of the Hindu Trinity with between Brahma, the creator, Vishnu, the preserver, and then Shiva, the destroyer. It's all, it's all this. It's all the same symbolism packed in here. Not me. Fate. You want me to kill... Robert Dean Darden? Not me. Fate. So there you have it. It's about fates. Fates 
is what they're taking their orders from is what they look to for answers fate is what they are sacrificing people for fate we're gonna keep that in mind we're gonna talk about this deeper as we go avengers endgame one of the most popular movies in the world. I think it was like one of the highest grossing box office hits in the past couple of years. And it was about going back in time to change what happened because they didn't like the, the consequences of what happened. And so they got to try to change that so they can save the future because they did not like losing to Thanos. Right. So we're going to take a quick look at this as well, because there's a there's a moment in here in Avengers Endgame where the quote unquote Sorcerer Supreme which is someone like Dr. Strange. It's this magician lady. Uh, she's explaining to the Hulk about timelines and about time travel. And she does it with very specific graphics. We'll just, uh, we'll let maybe the audio hang out until we get to the right moments. I'll skip forward a little bit. So Hulk shows up on this roof and sees this bald headed lady. That's the Sorcerer Supreme. And he's like, you got that time stone. I need that time stone. And uh, this would be like Mystery Science 3000. Uh, I'll just dub over there. They're talking. And then she's like, isn't my yellow robe cool? I point like Hitler. And I got this Agamogo time stone on my chest. And you're not getting it. And he's like, I need it. And she's like, no, you're not getting it. Don't touch me. I'll call HR. And then he's like, all right, but I need it. And he's like, looking all creeper. And then boom, she she kicks his soul out of his his uh, genetically demonic body and then starts talking to his soul because she's a witch she's a sorcerer supreme so then they they let hulk take a nap for a little bit while he's running around supplicating to her trying to get that time stone trying to explain All right, I'm, I'm not i'm not sure the science really supports that and then she draws a timeline i know that seems kind of on the nose but she draws an actual timeline to explain what time travel is and how affecting things happens. The infinity stones create what you experience as the flow of time. Remove one of the stones and that flow splits. Now this may benefit your reality, but my new one, not so much. Because remember, they believe in the multiverses in the storyline. So they're talking about how it's affecting different universes different multiverses when they change times timelines in this new branch reality without our chief weapon against the forces of darkness our world would be overrun millions will suffer so tell me doctor can your science prevent all that no but we can erase it because once we're done with the stones we can return each one to its own timeline at the moment it was taken so chronologically in that reality, it never left. So what they're talking about is if they change something and affect a bad consequence, they can stave off that bad consequence by going back through manipulation of time and reality to change it back to erase the bad consequence. So another, another interesting um, version of this concept that we're going to be exploring through the ancient texts and how they talked about it and how it is uh, relatable to the coming of our Messiah. Interstellar was a, a video like when it came out back in the day, I thought it was cool. 2012, 2013, something like that. Um, this is before I understood true cosmology. And uh, this is about, you know, Matthew McConaughey is a farmer who becomes a, a, a reluctant spaceman so that he can go and save the world. And so there's this, uh, keep in mind of the symbolism of the actual spaceship of the, of the nodes around the singular thing. They look like little, uh, looks like it looks like a bracelet, like a 13 year old would have a little charms on it. But um, those nodes are supposed to be a part of the spaceship that, that can get close to these different gravitational waves and be affected by time. And there's even a scene in the movie where he goes down onto a planet with some other people and um, the, the people that are left in the spaceship, or at least the one guy that's left in the spaceship, he ages like 60 years by the time that um, Matthew McConaughey gets back because of the big bright black hole that's near the planet changes the gravitational waves of time within the fake heliocentric model using this idea of space time with relativity theory. And so therefore 
by the time that and hear this closely because this is going to come up in a minute by the time that the astronauts leave and come back about 60 years has passed right a whole bunch of time has passed so by the time they go down to the planet and come back up to something floating above the planet but in this particular thing by the time they go from the circle of where men live to the black planet to where he is and get back to the circle there's been a time a temporal displacement because of the effects of gravity right so just keep this in mind this is a lot a uh, lot to do with what we're going to be discussing later and of course interstellar also had this aspect in it because there's two different plot points they were going to try to save the world and find this astronaut and then they had this this ongoing plot line with his daughter he didn't want to leave because he knew by the time he got back she would be older and he tries to go into the fifth dimension some sort of warping of space and time which looks like a large disheveled bookshelves all over the place like a maze actually almost like a three-dimensional maze or maybe like a labyrinth yes so in case you watched the last episode like i said this is going to explore deeper into that same concept except this is not just a game or an entrapment. This goes into the mental labyrinth of Ra, Satan, Zeus, Brahma, same person. It goes into the mental labyrinth of him himself. So we see this unique moment where he thinks that he can go into another dimension and go somehow communicate to his daughter to, to, to affect the end of the story, but he doesn't. So this is uh, called the interstellar. There's other movies we all have seen throughout time that are really famous. The time machine 2002 is another adaptation or remake from 1960s movie to time machine. It's actually uh, the, the video version of the famous book by HG Wells, the time machine that came out in the early 20th century. Um, Edge of tomorrow, man, I really liked edge of tomorrow. I thought that was a really cool movie. And uh, you had Tom Cruise kind of having a Groundhog Day moment where he kept waking up every time he would die, trying to figure out how to defeat these aliens. And at the end of the movie, he sees the the central brain that has the power for time travel. That's a part that the aliens are trying to protect is this black orb. And that's what he has to try to blow up because that was what was affecting time and reality and causing him to every time you die, wake up and start over again. I think the subtitle of, of the edge of tomorrow was live, die, repeat. And so very, very interesting, right? Then of course you had Bill and Ted time travel concept, very zany, silly, great classic movie from, from our childhood traveling in a time booth, um, a phone booth, excuse me, going through time. And, um, oh, that was a mistake. The time machine's already there, but Harry Potter and the prisoner of Azkaban, um, Hermione, the girl on the left behind him, she's got this little necklace that she can rewind time like two or three days. They have to use it to save the, you know, to save everybody at one point. Um, so they deal with time travel and Planet of the Apes. Another another concept of like what like with Interstellar, Planet of the Apes, uh, if I remember the original story, not the one that they remade in the past 10 to 15 years where it's like a trilogy now, but like the 1970s or 1960s Planet of the Apes. I'm pretty sure the guy like gets in a space crash or something and he comes back to earth and um and earth has already progressed in time to where humans are not there planet the apes ran by planet excuse me the planets ran by apes and so it's, it has the aspect of time travel in it with great change and he doesn't know how to affect it and get it and get it to stop um 12 monkeys some of you guys may remember this movie from the mid 90s 12 monkeys this was an interesting one kind of a cult classic for people that you know, really like the, you know, these, these really off movies. They even ended up trying to make a, a full on TV series out of this, I think 10, 15 years ago or something, but 12 monkeys, Brad Pitt again, um, or excuse me, Bruce Willis and Brad Pitt. And this is the look of the time machine. Again, keep that in mind because it's going to matter as we explore these ideas in real life, keep that in mind. But remember when this came out, this came out in the mid nineties, not so this is all predictive programming, but we're going to explain exactly how. So let's look at a quick little clip here from the 12 monkeys. All 
All right, so the machine's in the background. You can't see all of it because it's kind of half like covered up right now. But the machine's in the background, and this machine might look familiar to some of you. And they're they're going to inject his body. He's going to at this at this particular scene. I think he goes back to like World War One era. They're going to inject his body and uh, try to get him to go affect some things and change things for their benefits to stave off this pandemic that happens in the future. So twelve monkeys. They they insert him. They light him up and boom into the circular circular thing and then it doesn't show any more that it just skips right to him being in world war one after that um the terminator franchise create you know ridiculously popular franchise uh, i think they made another movie like two three years ago like the sixth one uh, these are all six of them some of the movie posters obviously we've talked about the idea of talos in our investigating babylon series being the old school greek representation of what's now being shown to us as the ai robots that are protectors and destroyers and uh partly sentient and this this entire franchise has everything to do with time travel it's constantly it is the main mechanism in how this is uh that is the plot point for this series so all of them it's about a circular ring that creates an orb that allows them to travel through time. <laughs> it's all the same thing. Back to the future. All right, guys, I think we're back. I think we got to a little, uh, it's like I said, I was trying to keep it, I was trying to keep it away from that happening as much as possible because of uh, YouTube, you know, YouTube doing their thing. Um, yeah, you guys go, uh, Lighthouse is still coming, but in the meantime, uh, you guys go follow us on Kingdom of Context on Rumble. And um, we already got a channel up there, but nobody's watching over there, so. Go follow us. Go watch over there if you need to. All right, guys. We're going to try to get through this. As you saw, Back to the Future, 1, 2, and 3. Very, very, very famous. Um, it's just... Uh, it's it's one of those franchises that is... It's so amazingly... It's so interesting because before having this mindset and, and really seeing all the things to see about this topic... You just think it's good entertainment. Like it's it's a well done movie, especially the first one. Um, I actually like the second one. wasn't a huge fan of the third one, and but I, I thought the first and second one were decent. You know, good stuff. And especially when you get introduced as a kid, and it seems amazing. They're flying in a car. They have this. They they have to be able to time travel through certain elements, and we're going to talk about that here in a minute. So I'm going to do my best to play a little clip, but I don't know if it's going to let me because I'm just playing a it's I actually took a lot of the audio out of this clip and it's a it's one that I made um so let me see if I can do this real quick because we're going to be just stopping it periodically to do some commentary so it starts out with them in the mall parking lot trying to do the time travel 
Einstein is the dog sitting in the car and they're like, oh, there goes the flux capacitor behind him and boom, time travel. Notice that Doc Brown is wearing this, Doc Brown is wearing this uh, radiation suit, but it's really not a radiation, it's just a white suit, but it's got the symbol for radiation on the suit. That's that's a part of it because it's always a part of it in these movies. All of these movies we've shown you so far, the Terminator, he's powered by a nuclear power. Um, everything that we've shown you in all these movies has to do with some sort of extremely large, like high level, high tech, advanced system of power that allows for the, the time travel. Okay. Now I know there's a lot of people out there that, that don't agree that, um, that nuclear power is exactly what they describe it to be. That's it regardless. It's the point of them thinking they need the power to make this a reality. That's the part to focus on. The license plate said out of time, right? The temporal nice displacement pun. occurred exactly one He talks about a temporal displacement. That's time travel. Okay. We're going to hear that again in a minute. It's going to make sense. Yeah, yeah, it's zero seconds. I sent him into the future. Wait a minute, Doc. Uh, are you telling me that you built a time machine out of a DeLorean? All right. So then it comes back. They check it out. It's full of ice. They open the Come doors. Here. I'll show you how it works. Right. He's going to show them how it actually works. First, you turn the time circuits on. <laughs> All right. So this part's interesting because he actually, he, he didn't need to do this. When I was a kid, I never knew why. I, I feel like I know why now, but when I was a kid and I was looking at this, I felt like, man, why, why did he, this seems like redundant. Like, why would you have a destination time, a present time and a last of time departed? Like, I thought, why wouldn't you just at minimum just need to know what present time you're in? And then at maximum, you would need to know like sets where you want to go. Like, but you don't need to know. I don't know. It just it, to me, it was it seemed extra to have a last time departed. But the more I study the subject, the more I realize the, this this Trinity concept is always there. The destination time. <laughs> The destination time is something where you're going forward. You've opened up your journey. That is creation. That represents Brahma. Vishnu, the preserver, is the one who maintains what's happening now in present reality. Your last time departed is what is past, what has been destroyed, what is now done and over. That represents Shiva. And I didn't, I didn't understand because I thought it was just, I was like, man, that's not, that is, that's not necessary. Like my little OCD brain was going off with this, with this show, but there's more to it. This readout tells you where you're going. This one tells you where you are. This one tells you where you were. Huh. You a vision, a picture in my head, a picture of this. This is what makes time travel possible. All right. So he points at this thing called the flux capacitor. Its shape is extremely important. And this is what he says. This is what makes time travel possible. The flux capacitor. The flux means things that are constantly in motion, usually large, large uh, ideas, large concepts of things in motion, and also can be related to water. Time is constantly referred to as water, a fluid state. And then the capacitor is a just a synonym for the word transistor, which is a part of alchemy and hermetic language for what they call the sun, moon and stars and the influences on reality as a transistor. This is why astrology is so important to them because it affects the energies and the powers within the creation. So if you're going to manipulate that and the flow of those energies throughout creation, that's why he built a flux capacitor. The flux capacitor. I need a nuclear reaction to generate the 1.21 gigawatts of electricity I need. Doc so you guys remember um, before this scene when he's in, he had gone back to the future at the beginning of the movie and he goes to Doc Brown's house and Doc Brown has on that weird large crate thing like a, he's trying to read Marty's mind and then they start talking and Marty has to convince him he's from the future and then they start talking and he's trying to and Doc Brown's trying to actually like process what he's being told and he tells and Marty's like, yeah, but um, you know, you, you, you used uh, plutonium to, and he's like plutonium. He's like, uh, I, I don't have any, I can't just go get any plutonium in the 1950s. And so uh, Marty uh, hands him this flyer talking about the electrical, uh, the lightning bolt. And uh, because he was like, plutonium, that's, I would need, 
I would need 1.21 gigawatts of power. And he's like, that would be like a, a strike of lightning, like a bolt of lightning. And so then that's where they, you know, he looks at the old newspaper Kipling about the, the clock tower that was struck with lightning at a specific time because the clock stopped at that time. Who's related to lightning? Zeus, Brahma. It's the power. It's that extra power. And it's always, every time there's a time travel events in these movies, there's a, there's lightning that's shooting and sparking and, and, uh, and radiating off of the, off the, the portal or the transition moment or the sphere that's created. And so here, um, this is what the catalyst for making this time travel possible was they needed the strike of lightning. But before he figured out a way to do it through nuclear radiation. And this I is why he, he steals it and, and buy plutonium. So he steals it from the Iranians or the uh, Syrians or somebody and he steals plutonium to power it. But then they need once he's in the past, he doesn't have it access. So they need lightning. So it's, it's very interesting um, how they're doing this. And uh, I don't know. Are we still on? <laughs> I, can't, I don't even know if we're still on. OK, I think we're still on. Um. This is the book from the early 20th century, H.G. Wells, The Time Machine. And for everyone that's been watching this, it's Anubis. Well, we talked about the Sphinx, what it represents, the lion avatar of Anubis. This is uh, the same that's consistent with the representation to the Assyrians, to the Chaldeans, to the Phoenicians. This was the representation of Nurgle. It's the lion man avatar of Anubis. Another version of Hermes, Nurgle, to the Babylonians, Assyrians, Akkadians, Phoenicians, Canaanites. And this is what he puts on the front. The only image he puts on a very simplistic book in the early 20th century. He puts Anubis. You think, man, that's weird, huh? That's strange. So let's look at something real quick. I promise this is all going to tie together. I'm introducing ideas and terms and ideas that relate to the things that we've been seeing in these movies that are being predictively programmed to us and why they include certain elements in every single one of these movies. The triquetra, it's not just a symbol that was adopted by Latin Trinitarians in approximately the 9th century AD. The triquetra is from the Latin adjective triquetras, which means three-cornered, is a triangular figure composed of three interlaced arcs, um, three overlapping Visaisi Pisces lens shapes. The term triquetra is in, in archaeology is used of any figure consisting of three arcs. The term triquetra is used in archaeology of any figure consisting of three arcs, including a pinwheel design of the type of the triskeles, now that uh, for some of you guys that may be fans of the Marvel series, the Triskelion may come to mind because that was the actual design of um, Hydra's base in Winter Soldier. Uh, like I, I've said this before, guys. Um, Captain America: Winter Soldier from 2014. It is not a, a fictional movie; it's a documentary. It's it's a crazy movie, guys. Um, but that was the shape of their of their evil base that was government funded as they were. A, implemented into the government was the triskelion and that is another representation of the triquetra such symbols became frequent from about the fourth century bc ornamenting ceramics of anatolia that is where the temple of zeus is near pergamum in persia and it appears on early lycian coins so let's look at a quick clip about uh, sacred geometry that's going to break down the triquetra and and what the occult views it how they view this symbol not not very confused christians who believe the trinity is a thing but the occult and welcome to sacred geometry language of the universe my name is seth and i'm here to share sacred geometry with the whole world first i would like to thank you for your support for your subscriptions for your likes and for your comments it means a lot to me and it does encourage me to make more videos for this channel. My passion for sacred geometry has changed my life and it has helped me a lot. And I want to share that with all of you. Today, 
I will address a new sacred geometry shape that many of you have requested. This shape has been adopted by many cultures and it is called the Triketra. The word Triketra simply means triangle or three-cornered triangle, which translates to triketris in Latin. In Christianity, this shape has been used as a religious symbol representing the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. This form represents the unification of these three entities, if you will, and that's why they call it the Holy Trinity. In the Celtic tradition, the Triketra used to represent the land, the sea, and the sky. It is considered to be one of the oldest symbols out there, dating back to as early as 500 BC. In a Celtic tradition, they believed that everything in this world came in threes. For example... And there's the triangle. Also, he's going to talk about the circle, that you often see this symbol with the circle inside of it as well. The three stages of life, life, death, and rebirth. The three phases of time, past. Life, death, and reverse, symbolized in the Hindu trinity. Brahma is the creator, gives life. Death is Vishnu, the preserver and the maintainer. And then the rebirth is the is Shiva, the destroyer, who also creates a new universe and rebirths it. Past, present, and future. We also have in spirituality, body, mind, and soul. Sometimes the traditional Triketra symbol is accompanied by a circle. The circle is often interlaced with the Triketra, which represents the bond between the three elements. In addition, the circle in many belief systems is used to depict eternity. Keep that in mind because we're going to look at other symbols where they use the circle to depict the idea of eternity relationing to time. Now this is all very interesting, but I'm going to show you why the Triketra is designed in such a way. So as you can see here, we're going to take the Vesica Pisces and we're going to use it as a reference. So if you haven't watched the episode of the Vesica Pisces, feel free to watch it because it's going to be a prerequisite to understanding how the Triketra is formed. You, you don't need it, he's going to show you right now. We already see the number three showing here before the formation of the Triketra. The circle on the left is one, the circle on the right is two, and then the intersection of the two circles or the Vesica Pisces is number three. So number three represents creation, the start, the beginning of something new. Source is not satisfied with this. It's not satisfied with the creation of the Vesica Pisces. It What's not satisfied with it? Source. Source. You guys remember what we talked about last week about the uh, Gnostic beliefs of Neoplatonic views? It comes from philosophy, from the Aristotelian, all the way back to the Egyptian Ma'at. All right. Like I said, some of the stuff we discussed last week, we're just going to dive deeper this week. But it's it, there's a slightly different vein, but a lot of this information is supplemental to what we watched in the labyrinth. And uh, there's it's just it's all connected wants to expand even further and it decides to create a third circle to expand itself even more or to experiment or to experience more aspects of existence or more aspects of life and now we have wants to experience more aspects of existence more than what it already knows this is the multiverse idea as you can see in the screen we have three circles but if we delete some of the lines that are intersecting with each other within these three circles, you get the Triketra. But why three? Why three circles? Why not four circles? In spirituality, three represents the Ascended Masters, and Jesus died at 33.
I don't know if I I don't know if he died at 33 or not. I just that's that's just this guy's idea. In the occult and in spirituality, number three keeps coming up quite often. It is associated with mastery, divinity, and expansion. Let's consider that the left. Did you, did we see that, guys? It's associated with mastery, divinity, and expansion. And expansion. Let's consider that the left circle is the male aspect and the right circle is the female aspect. Now when these two aspects form the Vesica Pisces, you can give birth to balance, harmony, respect, integrity, equality. But if you want to expand even further, the creation of a third circle, number three, here in this example represents the child. The three of them represents the completion of creation. But I want to bring your attention to something here which I mentioned in the beginning. So if we put a triangle around the triketra, as you can see here, the triangle fits perfectly on top of the triketra, which has 60 degrees on each corner, which is... By the way, guys, the... Uh... The center of the triquetra that's actually illuminated green right now is the shape of the of the ship on Flight of the Navigator. <laughs> 60 times 3 equals 180. 1 plus 8 equals 9. And number 9 in numerology is the number of completion. It means the end of a cycle. If we take number nine and divide it by three, the corner of the triangles, we get number three, which is the number of the triketra. So as you can see, even in numerology, everything makes sense between the number three, nine, and six, which are divine magical numbers that are quite mysterious. And I'm gonna talk about these numbers in another episode. There's the three, six, nine, and we're not, this is not a little John song. Uh, there's the, the famous 369 from the occult, and this is how they, they factor it in. In more details. All right, so that's it for that. But have we seen this symbol? Yes, we know that Christians have adopted this symbol in Trinitarian circles, and they use it. But that's a much later thing. And I don't think that the symbol itself is somehow, you know, a branding of something demonic. I just think that um, this is some of the language that the occult uses to speak with each other and when they know what it means according to their their uh, sacred geometry, which goes back to, you know, um, what's his name? Pythagoras, right? Uh, an, an Apollo worshiper and an occult. But there is another unique moment where this, uh, you know, these Marvel movies are, are hilarious because they show us all kinds of stuff. But there's a moment where someone can have the power to go to another dimension in one of these marvel movies and he at right after he um sends his son to another dimension in a split second you got to watch closely i'm gonna play this little clip and i don't think there's any sound to it you got to watch closely as he blows on the milnor which is the hammer of thor it's odin the one that rep is the dramatic representation of Ra, and he blows on the hammer of thor and it just very very faintly shows the shadow of the triquetra um it's it's just a quick moment. You gotta, you gotta watch it quick. So he's, we're gonna skip, skip forward a little bit. He's fighting with his, with Thor, and then he gets mad and he's like, "All right, I'm stripping you of your powers." Tells Loki to be quiet. He's like, "Give me those powers. You don't deserve this cool cape." Give me the cape. I haven't had breakfast today. And I will not eat until I cast you out. And then he, and then Loki looks on. He's like, is he going to shoot? Is he going to cast me out next? What's going to happen here? And then he's like, oh, he's going to grab Mjolnir, which is usually Thor's weapon. He's like, give it to me. I'm taking back your toys. You're grounded. And he's going to like, oh, give me all your toys. And then get out of my house. Get to your room. He's going to send him in through the portal, the circular portal that takes him to another dimension, send him to Earth. 
And then watch what he does when he blows on Milnor and he speaks a curse on the Milnor. There's the Triquetra. So this kind of stuff is layered into all these movies. And uh, it, you just got to know what you're looking for, basically. When I, obviously, when Thor came out in 2000, what, 2010, 2009, I don't, I don't remember, it was a long time ago. I didn't know what I was looking at, right? I just thought, ooh, it's like that cool Celtic writing, you know, like uh, ancient Germanic uh, slash Celtic, maybe, who knows? Like, I had no clue, right? But no, there's a lot. There's a lot here that's just constantly in our face. So now, someone was already asking about Kabbalah. Oh, no. Oh, no. Okay. All right, and we're back. Just think about how many uh, YouTube channels play commercials, video clips, teasers of movies. Uh, they'll do full reviews on movies. Uh, just, just think about, think about how many get to to play all those clips and talk about them and pause it and watch a few few more minutes and pause it and talk, and uh, they just. They get to have an entire channel dedicated just for that. Nothing ever happens. Isn't that amazing? All right. Now, guys, we're going to be talking about uh, as we, we move away, not away, but we continue to add to this idea of the Triquetra as well as this idea of multi dimensions and time travel, mastery over time. Um, someone asked earlier in the live chat about Kabbalah. Yes, it's actually related as well. We're about to get into it as well as something called the double trinity relating to Shiva from ancient India. So this is called the Om. Right. You guys seen all those like when people are meditating, they're like, oh, right. So this is where this comes from. And it's actually has everything to do with the topic tonight. The Om or the Om, depends on how you say it, from ancient Sanskrit, is a sacred sound. It's a syllable, a mantra, an invocation in Hinduism. Is one of the most important symbols of Hinduism. It is variably said to be the essence of the supreme absolute consciousness kind of like the source you guys remember what we talked about when we talked about the neoplatonic ideas that go back to aristotelian or uh the the categorization of this idea of how they viewed philosophy and what was most important and the essence is most important that was number one on aristotle's list this is what sparked neoplatonism which influenced Maimonides to create a codified ideas within Judaism based off Neoplatonic Aristotelian philosophy, which goes back to ancient Egyptian Ma'at, the ultimate doctrine coming down from Ra, from Hathor. So to the, to the Indians in ancient Hinduism, they refer to this as the Om. 
and it is the the essence of the supreme absolute consciousness atman the brahman or the cosmic world in indian traditions om serves as a sonic representation of the divine that means a sound right a syllable a standard of vedic authority in a central aspect of soteriological doctrines and practices At the end of chapters in the vedas the upanishads and in other hindu texts excuse me the symbols often found at the beginning and the end of the chapters in those texts it is an absolute character syllab syllabolic representation of the hindu trinity as you can see on the top there shiva is represented with the star and the crescent the outer circle is represented by vishnu and then the backwards or the number three what looks like a, a english number three is the representation for brahma this together creates the hindu trinity the sound of the om and it's depicted with what they call a double trinity which exists inside of what looks like a six-pointed star but it's made up of two triangles trying one triangle going up and one triangle going down it's the shakti and the shiva triangles put together creates the six point and this is found within their tree of life which is also a part of the kabbalah 10 levels of dimension this is why it's all replete within their astrology their numerology their symbolisms for their trinity so I even went on a forum where Hindi people were talking about the Om and the symbols of Shiva. And they're talking about this symbol and explaining it. People from India explaining what these symbols mean. Just in case people are watching and they say, oh, how do you know? How do you know what you're talking about? You can't trust all the scholars' interpretation. People from India explaining what these symbols mean. The Shiva, the upward, the upward triangle, and the shakti the pointing down triangle put them together you get the six-pointed star and that represents the om represents the hindu trinity it represents literally the cosmic dance and the points of the famous statue of shiva and i'm sure you guys can all see that it looks like something else we all recognize too right Several years ago, in an archaeological site in Aswan, Egypt, the discovery of a two-star of David engravings on an ancient Roman temple in Egypt's southern city of Aswan has caused an uproar. Dr. Mahmoud Afifi, head of the Egyptian Antiquities Branch in the Antiquities Ministry, has accused a delegation of German archaeologists working on the site's reconstruction of defaming the site by engraving the Star of David into a stone in the shrine, the Jerusalem Post reports. Afifi ordered the archaeologists to remove the stone from the temple and threatened to take legal action against them. Think about what we're reading here, guys. <laughs> in Egypt, now remember, in case you're not familiar, the Greeks and the Romans ruled over Egypt for a long, long time. But they worship the same gods. This is what we've tried to express in many, many videos. So while doing excavation on an ancient Roman temple in Aswan, Egypt, that's not that's not in Memphis. That's not in Cairo. That's deep. That's in what we used to be called the Upper Kingdom. That's in very southern Egypt. That's the base of the Nile. Roman temple excavation. They found a double trinity, a quote unquote Star of David. Now the modern, um, the modern institute director uh, of this, who's Islamic, thought it looked like a Star of David, but that's just an, a modern day example of how little most cultures know about ancient history that the romans had this symbol replete on their temples the greeks had it replete in the temples the egyptians had this in their temples the indians had this in their temples the phoenicians the akkadians the babylonians the assyrians and here is an ancient roman temple looking at the ceiling right so if you lay down your back and you looked up at the ceiling you would see the double trinity with a god in the center underneath the ceiling how about at, on the the stained glass on a mormon temple you know that religion that was created by a guy who had absolute history of masonic brotherhood 
Joseph Smith. And here it is inside different symbols as it points to this double trinity idea that that is the physical representation of the essence of the absolute supreme within the Hindu belief system and their trinity is also found within a tree of life, Sephiroth. It's also encircled by a snake that's eating itself with the onk in the middle, with the, the peace sign, which the, you know, the, the Nazis absconded later, but it's originally supposed to be a peace sign, ancient India. But this, this was the symbols for their gods. It's all consistent. So it's so consistent that jewelry makers even know, whoever this person is, they even know that the triquetra is directly related to the Om. It's the same thing. Just different part of the world, different representation. So they made a ring and someone made a pendant. The Om in the middle layered in the decorative triquetra on the outside encircling it. Yes, yeah, seven fresh water. It's, a, it's the Ouroboros is the snake that eats itself. Also represents time and the inevitability of death. We're going to be talking about that as we keep going. So this is the Assyrian representation of the double trinity with one of their uh, gods holding a staff with it at the top. Here's hermetic uh, drawing board. Speaking about the, the systems of the air, the spheres of the sky, the powers that be, a lot of representation in this. But yes, you can see it's got the triquetra with the double trinity inside the sun type object in the center towards the top. It's got the circles down below. Yeah, there's a ton of ton of symbolism in this alchemy board here. This is a memorial building that was built for the South African Air Force in South Africa. We all recognize this shape, the square and compass from Freemasonic symbols. And this, guys, this is the actual airport from 19, I think it was 1961, in the Heathrow Airport in London. They built an airport with the double trinity. Now, let's just take a moment and think about this. For one, if you're designing airports, this is the dumbest design you've probably ever seen in your life. But two, if you're driving up to this or being taken by bus up to the airport, to this place, you can't see this design. You can only see it from the air. Large complex. It's an airport in London. Busy, large complex. I wouldn't say that this is masterfully designed from an engineering standpoint as far as managing flight routes. People trying to take off and land at the same time. This looks like an actual absolute cluster, a nightmare to be an air traffic controller. But, but why would they build this? You can only see it from the air. Massive double trinity, a double. Uh, it's crazy. All right. So this one should not have, this clip should not have any at all copyright on it. Okay. Well, we'll see. We will absolutely see. But let's talk about the ancient Hinduism and the, the multiverse. Now, they're going to be mentioning several things in here. I'm going to stop it occasionally and talk about a couple concepts. Perhaps one of the most exciting and unsettling concepts in modern cosmology is the theory that we inhabit a multiverse. According to this theory, our universe is not the only universe. There are many others perhaps an infinite number, each with different physical properties. This concept may be novel and disconcerting to scientists, but it rests very comfortably in ancient Hindu cosmology. The Vedas and other Hindu scriptures are believed to date from 5000 BC to 26000 BC, are full of descriptions of many worlds whose inhabitants are ruled by kings on the human universe and gods on the higher universe. So did you see, did you hear that? Gods on the higher universe. The many gods in turn belong to many different universes and plans of existence. Do we see this on screen? It says there's a realm of 330 million demigods and demons. Hmm. Didn't what what was that on the uh, the Georgia Guidestones? They wanted to reduce the world population to five hundred million. Hmm. I wonder how many. What was it? 
what is it calculation in Revelation 9? Isn't it 200 million things come out with the polyon out of the pit? Interesting. The idea of a physical multiverse came later to modern science than it did to Hinduism. The concept that time is cyclical may sound strange to some, but it is true that it will happen over and over again. One hypothesis states that there is even the possibility of having the same Earth as ours and that the same events are happening there too. Which means that you are experiencing this moment in another place, which may sound strange. But this is a possibility according to signs and Vedic scriptures in other universes. So just in case you couldn't hear her, she said yes multiple universes is a possibility not just from science but from vedic scriptures that's ancient hinduism one could be living in the future or perhaps in the past for example maybe you are experiencing a part of the ramayan or mahabharat or any other event from past history in some other universe at the same time as now according to science so that's something interesting that a lot of these shows and movies are starting to portray not that the like it's even i think coming up in the new flash movie that that i've seen trailers for where it's all about time travel as well and um and it's this idea that if you go to another dimension where there's an equally um similar looking life like yours they may not be in the exact same timeline as you that way they may be doing they, they may be a, a thousand years behind you or whatever it depends on and, and supposedly in this you know the modern theory of the multiverse not only is there infinite number of other realities and other worlds where you exist making different decisions, but you exist at different points in time. It's all nonsense, but this is also being talked about in um, theorized in ancient Hinduism. These possibilities may be there, but Hinduism believes that there is a multiverse in which things repeat. themselves for ages and it is a cyclical and unstoppable process ramayan so that was this this circle did you guys see the ouroboros uh this the infinity circle of the thing going around and around same kind of symbols just like we see the circle in all the all the movies for time travel there's always some kind of circular object they're in there's a multiverse in which things repeat themselves for ages and it is a cyclical and unstoppable process. Ramayan is a Sanskrit epic that dates back to ancient India and tells the story of Lord Ram. Dude's got so many hands, he probably can't even wipe himself. There's no room to reach behind you. I mean, this is just pointless at this point. Who is an incarnation of Lord Vishnu? Lord Ram was about to complete his incarnation period and he called Yam the god of death to fetch him but yam couldn't because lord hanuman was guarding the gate of ayodhya and he did not let yam in because hanuman swore to keep death away from his lord but as lord ram knew things had to go on and one day he dropped his ring into a crack of the earth and asked hanuman to bring it to him all right watch this guys watch this so we've all, we've all seen uh, Ant-Man, the movies that have been made popular by, by Marvel, the Ant-Man movies where he can become real big or real, real small. This is from ancient Hinduism. So this Raman, Ramanan dropped his ring and he asked this monkey-faced dude, Humana, uh, to go get it for him. And with his powers, Hanuman shrank in size and followed the crack to Patal Lok. And then he met the serpent king, Vasuki who knew the cycle of life and death and took Hanuman to the mountain of rings where Hanuman realized that. Think about this for a minute. In, in Mark, Mark chapter, or excuse, Matthew chapter 8, when Yeshua walks up to the man who's filled with demons and the demons start talking to him and he says, uh, we are legion for we are many. Now, now, it doesn't exactly say how many demons were inside this man. We know that it seemed like it was more than two. And legion is usually a word that represents thousands as far as being a, a Roman military word, like a, a 
like a platoon, but much, much greater, like a legion. I'm pretty sure it's like a thousand. So, and some people have speculated many thousands. How did they all fit inside of one man? They have to get small. It's an interesting concept. All those rings were from Lord Ram and told him who asked Vasuki about the mysterious series of events. Then Vasuki explained that each ring represents the cycle of time called Kal Chakra, which has four quadrants. Ram was incarnated in Treta Yoga and then one day a ring will fall in the lower world, Patal Lok, and Hanuman will come looking for the ring and up there, Lord Ram will complete his incarnation period. So, there are millions of billions of these Kal Chakra which have come across multiple parallel universes. Lord Ram would end his carnation and take birth again and again. However, the cycle never breaks and it repeats itself again and again. Hanuman then learned of Lord Rama's motive by informing him about his various incarnations in different universes so that he would let him go with Yam to die and to take birth again. This proves the existence of a... By the way, it doesn't prove anything, but according to her religious belief, she thinks it proves something. ...parallel universe since many times in process is happening and will continue to happen as well. Be kind and be happy. Because in some other universe, there is a possibility that Lord Rama is in Lanka attacking Ravan also now. These concepts are a bit tricky and we don't need to worry about that because at this present on earth, Lord Ram has come before and the next incarnation of Lord Vishnu, namely Kalki, will come in the future. <laughs> I don't know if you guys caught that or not. <laughs> but... Uh... Uh, yeah, the, the, the next incarnation of Vishnu is the second beast of revelation and it's not a happy version. That's why she was just making that illusion there saying for now, smile and be happy because he could be attacking, but we don't need to worry about those thoughts. It's tricky. Just think the next time Vishnu comes, he'll be a Kalki, which means it's a version of him that's going to be attacking even in their own ancient religious beliefs and thoughts. Like it's like they, yeah, they created the ideas, not just Hinduism. Again, we've, since we've been uh, showing you emphatically throughout historical research, uh, li literally scholars themselves, I'm going to show you more uh, quotes from scholars that directly tie all these cultures together. They all knew, um, they absolutely all knew that they all shared the same pantheon of gods with different names. And because they walked away from the Tower of Babel, speaking different languages, they recognized, oh, that yeah, I remember that dude. Yeah, I used to I used to be able to speak to him. I don't know. He's speaking some gibberish now. I don't know what he's saying now, but like I remember his face. I worked beside him for a year. Like they they all knew these people and they just walked away speaking different languages. That's the story in scripture. That's the idea of how all the languages suddenly sprouted on the earth, which science can't explain etymology can't explain and so of course they, and then they realize oh we're, we're, they're all still worshiping jupiter or zeus they just have different versions of him according to their new cultures now and so we see this synchronicity in what they're worshiping and their philosophy of their theologies how they think about the universe and creation how they process it with a hermeneutic this is the philosophy of what we've been talking about with the ma'ats which they called true doctrine which what we just heard uh, in this cosmic age, this idea of the Om represents the true Brahman. That is the the Indian word, the Sanskrit uh, Hindu word for true doctrine, the right way to think about things in life. So, with this, they also they they know that their gods are destined to return, just like the, Chalde the Chaldeans have a prophecy that their their gods are destined to return. The the phoenix from ancient Egypt, Osiris, is destined to return. Ra's never gone anywhere. He's always been here. Um, like Apollyon was the only one destined to return. Quetzalcoatl, the flying serpent to the Mayans, he's destined to return. Vishnu, in a different avatar, a different version of himself, is destined to come back 
in a warrior-like manner in the future. Makes sense, since Anubis, the Egyptian equivalent of Vishnu, was the god of war. Makes sense. The, the second beast, the one that I'm putting forward throughout both these series, is the actual Anubis from the past. He's the one who makes people take the mark of the beast or he kills them. That's war, making war against the saints. And he's trying to get everyone to worship the first beast. So this is, they know, they know, they have their own version of what uh, the Hebrews passed down and now is passed down through Christianity as this eschatology of the end times. It just doesn't have the exact same details, but all the major pieces are still there. So, and there's even another video we'll watch by this particular channel where she talks about their ancient, uh, in India, their ancient scriptures have been um, lost um, or not lost, but they've been not studied and the people in her, in her country need to study them better. And so, Again, the big difference between it's not it, when I say they all have the same type of eschatology, just slightly different details. Well, some of those details are they're worshiping what the Hebrew Bible calls Satan. And this is why there's so much contention against the Bible itself. But no one's out here trying to ban the Vedic scriptures from any country. No one's trying to ban archaeological digs and and publications translating egyptian hieroglyphs about the 18th dynasty of the pharaohs of ramesses ii whom we'll talk about here in a minute related directly to one of the hindu gods they're not trying to ban that information all that religious information built into that only trying to ban the bible they're only trying to ban the story from the hebrews passed down from the prophets and the apostles because it tells of their fate and this is the bigger arching theme of the whole concept that all these religions, the Greeks, the Akkadians, the Assyrians, the Phoenicians, the Egyptians, the Babylonians, the Hindu, or the ancient Sanskrit, the ancient Vedas, they're trying, this is all, all of this theology we've been, we've been breaking down and unpacking is built into the idea of how they viewed destiny and fate and the mental labyrinth that they're in as they walk through those thoughts what they call Brahman. So we'll keep going. I'm just trying to make this as clear as possible for everybody. So let's look at the ancient Greeks. They had something called the Oracle of Delphi. Kind of a famous thing. Um, some people know about it. Some people don't, I suppose. The Oracle of Delphi. Here's the ruins from the, the region at Delphi, um, where this, this temple used to be a temple to Apollo, which had priests and priestesses. And here's an actual uh, evidentiary archaeological find of actual scripture. As we see in Acts 18, 12 through 17, there was a gentleman, named, uh, a ruler named Gallio, and uh, his inscription actually they've dug up directly from Delphi, from Koinonia Greek. And we actually see this in Acts 18, 12 through 17, when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews coordinated an attack on Paul and brought him before the judgment seats. This man is persuading the people to worship God in ways contrary to the law, they said. But just as Paul was about to speak, by the way, that was a lie. That's the accusation of the Jews. This is what they actually arrest him for in Acts 21, but it's a lie. He doesn't do that. It's the Pharisees lying to get him arrested, just like they did with Jesus. So they go on to say, but just as Paul was about to speak, Gallio told the Jews, if this matter involved a wrongdoing or a vicious crime, O Jews, it would be re reasonable for me to hear your complaints. But since it's a dispute about words and names in your own law, settle it yourselves. I refuse to be a judge of such things. And he drove them away from the judgment seat. At this, the crowd seized Sosthenes, the synagogue leader, and beat him in front of the judgment seat. But none of this was a concern of Gallio. So this is a scripture, and we've got archaeological evidence literally placing the ruler of the proconsul of Achaia um, found in scripture at Delphi which is this area that was literally a part of where Paul was trying to minister the gospel. What's so unique about the sanctuary of Apollo, specifically the Pythian Apollo, which was used to be, um, it was Apollo was the name that they took over this ancient serpent cult, um, this Python cult that was there. And then they adopted it as a place for worship for Apollo. It was the name Pythia was the name of the high priestess of the temple of Apollo at Delphi. She specifically served as its oracle and was known as the Oracle of Delphi. 
Her title was also historically glossed in English as Pythoness. The Oracle Adelphi was the Pythia was established in, at the latest in the eighth century BC. That's approximately during the days of, let me see, eighth century BC. So we're looking at King Ahab, maybe, maybe a little bit before that, as far as a biblical timeline, um, about 150 years after King Solomon. And though some estimates date it, date the shrine to as early as 1400 BC, which would be more like the days of Joshua. And it was widely credited for her prophecies uttered under divine possession by Apollo. The Pythian priestess emerged preeminent by the end of the 7th century BC and continued to be consulted until the late 4th century AD. It's a long time. So that's like well into the days of origin, right? That's, that's a long time after Christ. During this period, the Delphic Oracle was the most prestigious and authoritative oracle among the Greeks, and she was among the most powerful women of the classical world. So as you can see from the picture here, she had this little branch. She had this wine in a bowl that she would look at and scrape at with this little branch. And then these vapors would come up from this crack. She was sitting on this rock and then these little toxic vapors would come up and she would start to like hallucinate or do some things and supposedly be possessed by the spirit of Apollo and then start prophesying. And she would also start convulsing. And so um, without you know telling you, I'm just giving you a brief summary of the story that over time, they used to use attractive young, young maidens to do the prophesying, specifically uh, virgins, um, you see something like this in the movie 300, where the the gross, um, where the king Leonidas has to climb the mountain, and you got all these gross, wart-filled, old-looking men who've got like leprosy, and um, and then they have this attractive young maiden there whom they're abusing, and then they get her drunk, and there's there's smoke in the air, uh, you know. So they they basically they get her in, in this state of intoxication and then she prophesies whether Leonidas, Leonidas was going to be successful or not. That was like a modern version depiction of the ancient oracle of Delphi. And so, except she would sit on this little tripod, this little stool, this little intentionally designed triskelion stool <laughs> that uh, that she would sit in to to read the the, the bowl of wine with their little leaves. And then taking the vapors coming up from the ground and get high or get messed up neurologically because over time uh it was basically it was shortening the lifespan of the women so like the young maidens that they would choose for this um they would only last like 10 or 15 years because the the possess they said the possessions were too violent and so they started using older ladies because they thought well they're about to die anyway so it but think about that. Like if, if the earliest estimates are true, 1400 BC to 400 AD, I mean, you're looking at 1800 years of people traveling with a dedicated purpose to the, the temple of Apollo to go see this lady hallucinate and convulse and then supposedly tell them their future. They also had this unique interview process. I don't have time to go into all the details, but they had this interview process where they were like, make sure they would have they like her handlers. Let's put it like that. Her handlers would interview the people before they got there and say, what are you specifically asking about? <laughs> I'm like, did, did no one, did no one think about like how easy that would be to fake? Like, so you're literally asking the dude and, and they would vet them. So like they wouldn't let everybody come up and ask the Oracle questions. They would vet them and they would get their questions first. And then they would, make sure she's ready. And they do this ritual with killing a goat and looking at its liver and intestines and the blood and everything involved to make sure that the gods were going to allow for a good, um, a good prophecy that day. So if the, if they sacrifice the goat and the, and the blood didn't allow for a good prophecy, they'd turn everybody away. So they had all these, these unique little qualifiers to ensure that they had good success, right? So that the people were satisfied. And I'm like, yeah, it's like going to a fortune teller and telling the girl at the desk before you get to the back room, the fortune teller, like all your life stories and the questions you're going to ask and what you're worried about. And she has all this information to work with. Like, I mean, talk about parlor tricks, you know? So it's just, it's fascinating to me. Like they had this, uh, I mean, just con men are going to con. They've been around forever. I do not doubt possession and I do not doubt uh, the, the reality of witches and channeling demons and things like that. I just think it's really funny. They had all these extra qualifiers. So because they would say that the girls would not do well once they got possessed, sometimes they got so violent that they couldn't actually give a prophecy that people could understand. Like it was a, 
it was an untenable and unmanageable situation that they were trying to manage as best as possible. If I could put it like that. Now, modern scholars and, and people that try to make apologies to uh, hand, wave, hand wave dismiss anything supernatural, they'll just say, well, it was the vapors coming up from the rock that she was hallucinating on this on this type of gas that was coming up from the rock. And she wasn't really channeling anything. She wasn't really prophesying anything. It was just she was just getting high. And you're like, OK. Or getting high is the gateway for the channeling, which is what people have been saying for thousands of years. But, you know, you know, the uh, atheistic crowd just try to dismiss anything at all. The Oracle at Delphi also, since the first operation of the Oracle, the Temple of Delphi, it was believed that the God lived within a laurel, this holy plant, that they gave the oracles for the future with the rustling of the leaves. It was also said that the art of the divination had been taught to the God by the three winged sisters of Parnassus, the three. So this was this, uh, these ancient, uh, these ancient uh, prophecy telling nymphs that, that new div divination and ancient Greek history and myth. But the Greeks also had this belief and venerated this idea of prophecy. Cause remember what Yahweh would always talk about, right? His prophets, his anointed, his ordained prophets actually had his words in their mouth and not to listen to the prophets of the nations, the vain, the vain prophecies that prophesied good when he was trying to chastise them for disobeying the commandment. Remember when they worship Baal, Baal being the Phoenician Canaanite versions of these things, they had their own soothsayers and prophets. So in the, in the hierarchy, if you will, of that crowd, of that community of false prophets and soothsayers, diviners, mediums, uh, more famous ones were around. And the, the, this location at Delphi was the more famous, but there was other people practicing this stuff all over the place. We see it in the scriptures everywhere, right? Giving bad counsel to the rebellious kings of Israel and, and the Southern house, the Northern and Southern house. So the ancient Greeks valued this idea of prophecy so much that they had a triple-headed goddess called Morai in ancient Greek religion and mythology, Morai often known in English as the fates, were the personification of destiny. And they were three sisters, Clotho, that she did the spinning, Lachesis it was the allotter, and Atropos was the unturnable, a metaphor for death. Their Roman equivalent was Parse. The role of the Morai was to ensure that every being, mortal and divine, lived out their destiny as it was assigned to them by the laws of the universe. For mortals, this destiny spanned their entire lives and was presented as a thread spun from a spindle. So what did we watch earlier about the loom of fate from that really bad movie with Angelina Jolie called Wanted about the assassins bending bullets? They had this big loom of fate that spun out threads. That's where they get this from. This is the modern representation of an ancient belief, cult belief of the triple-headed goddesses of fate from ancient Greece. Generally, they were considered to be even above even the gods in their role as enforcers of fate. Although in some representations, Zeus, the chief of the gods, is able to command them. The concept of a universal principle of natural order and balance has been compared to similar concepts in other cultures, such as the Vedic, Rita, the Evastian Asha, that's Arta, and then the Egyptian Ma'at. And then I have the, the reference at the bottom. So right here, we literally have this idea of them trusting a specific set of gods for fate and destiny, represented by strings, controlled by Zeus, that has to do with your end life. And according to the, the furthering stories of this, if the woman that was called, what was she called? The third one, Atropos, if she was going to kill somebody prematurely, she would take scissors and take their string and cut them. So they could change fate. They could extend the string. What did the Sorcerer Supreme show the Hulk in that Avengers Endgame clip? She, she's trying to explain time travel to him and how the fates of everyone is involved. And she throws a magical string out for him to look at. It's all the same symbolism. It's all the same thing. Theosophy. It's a religion established in the United States during the late 19th century. It was founded primarily by the Russian, uh, some people call it Ukrainian, Helen Blavatsky, and draws its teaching predominantly from Blavatsky's writings. Categorized by scholars of religion as both a new religious movement and part of the occultist stream of Western esotericism, it draws upon the older European philosophies such as Neoplatonism, 
and Asian religions such as Hinduism and Buddhism. And by the way, guys, um, I'm not doing a full breakdown on Buddhism. Buddhism is very similar because the Buddha is an avatar of Vishnu. So very, very similar stuff. So theosophy, drawing upon the writings of European philosophy of Neoplatonism, what did we talk about that last, last time in the labyrinth? About some of the influencing philosophies of Neoplatonism that stretches all the way back to Aristotle and the Greeks, and all the way back to Ma'at, to the Egyptians. What did we just read about their belief in being able to having these gods of fate and destiny, a, a, a pantheon shared by the Greeks, the Egyptians, and the Hindus, and even the Ashtar, the Assyrians with Ashtar. So it's, it's all related, it's all the same. Theosophy goes on to be explained as it teaches that there's an ancient and secretive brotherhood of spiritual adepts known as masters who, although found around the world, are centered in Tibet. These masters are alleged by Blavatsky to have cultivated great wisdom and supernatural powers. Theosophy's founder, Ukrainian Helen Blavatsky, insisted that it was not a religion, although she did refer to it as the modern transmission of the once universal religion that she said had existed deep into human past with references at the bottom. So this occultist lady, super, super um, well-known in the occult world, says that this type of belief and everything that she built her formation of a, of a religion on is just a long-standing universal religion that goes all the way back into the past of humanity. Look at the symbol for them. Their mantra is no, there's no religion higher than truth. And they've got the double Trinity with the onk inside um, the Vedic symbols at the top of, of the, uh, I can't remember what that's called, the, the Vedic, Vedic peace sign, as well as the Om at the very top. And then of course the Ouroboros, which is the snake that eats itself, which is symbolizes eternity, infinite death and judgment and the unending cycle. It's all there. Don't take it from my words. The theosophists will tell you it's all connected. They even have one of their books. You got the double trinity encircled, snakes hanging down, the onk. You got the shakti, which is the or the uh, shav, the uh, upward triangle, which is represented by Shiva, and then you've got Anubis at the bottom. Sun in the background, angelic wings hanging down from the circle at the top, representing the sphere in the sky that can fly. It's all there. It's absolutely all there. These people know what they're doing. And of course we have the Ouroboros even represented in ancient Egypt encircling one of the uh, depictions of one of the pharaohs. They also knew what it was as well. None of this is by accident. None of this is just artistic license or interpretation. These people are communicating something. They're communicating to each other through symbols because why? because they can't talk through words anymore. <laughs> so they have to let each other know, ah, we're good. Yeah, I, I, I worship the same gods you do, we're good. I got the same symbols. They got the same tattoos, guys. They can't, they can't physically have language. It's very difficult, they have to learn new languages now. Much easier just to, just to communicate with symbols after the Tower of Babel. And this is what they started doing. Um, you have the Ouroboros. Actually, this is on a building in um, a government building in Oklahoma, in a small town in Oklahoma. But this is a, it's a, a symbol that's a Freemasonic symbol that's used all over the world throughout history. It's the Ouroboros encircling a little, you know, a, um, sands of time glass with wings coming off of it to symbolize uh, the infinity of time as well as death. Why is it on a government building? Here's a Freemasonic statue or artifact, whatever you're going to call it, the Sands of Time, Eye of Ra, the, uh, the, certain, you know, the triangle on the top, the whole thing, because they understand what the language means. They understand what it is. Here's a Ouroboros around the Masonic compass and square with the three stars representing the Trinity with the, the symbol on the bottom with the wings coming off. I don't know what the little three boxes are on the left, but it could be the cubes of Saturn. But you got the all-seeing eye in the middle. All, all the symbolism is there. It's all there. And here is the um, someone actually showing you how the Masonic uh, square and compass 
forms the double trinity, which is called the muragon, which is the, the mixture of the the upward triangle and the downward triangle, right? The the Shiva and the Shakti put them together. They call it the muragon or the Shaktana. And um, it's known to the Western world as the Star of David. Isaiah 65, 11 through 12. But you who forsake the Lord, who forget my holy mountain, who set a table for fortune and fill bowls of mixed wine for destiny, I will destine you for the sword and you will all kneel down to be slaughtered because I called and you did not answer. I spoke and you did not listen. You did evil in my sight and chose that in which I did not delight. Isaiah 65 and 66 and these wonderful chapters leading into the, the millennial kingdom, the restoration of the day of the Lord, um, you know, just everything involved in that promise of the kingdom come, the father and son come down and exact judgment on the nations and those who rule the nations, including unclean spirits and rebellious angels. So they knew this stuff was going on. They knew what it meant. And not just the idea that they worship gods that they call fate. They believed, because I'm going to show you here in a minute, that these gods that we're introducing, this idea of the multiverse that Hinduism talked about, uh, the idea of shrinking down and getting big, the idea of having an, another existence at the same time, the idea of stopping time, the idea of, like we saw in that video, you could visit someone, but then you come down, time has passed. Like when that guy went to get the king, went to go visit Brahma in the Hindu story, all of that stuff they believed was a power that the gods possessed and specific gods that we're going to break down here in a minute. So let's look real quick at time travel in actual Hinduism or what they claim. I should say what they claim is time travel. Give me one second. Let me make sure I can find this clip. And where to go? Hmm. Well, I don't, we, we already saw a, uh, I think I might skip this in any way. We already saw a clip that, delves into the same idea. Um, like I just talked about, there's a, there's an ancient Hindu story of a king that wants to go visit Brahma in the sky above. So Brahma lives in the air. He wants to go visit Brahma in the sky above and he goes and when he comes back down, there's been like, you know, hundreds of thousands of years have passed and Brahma has to tell him, well, there's a time displacement when you come to see me, you go back. By the way, I didn't tell you, <laughs> but there's a time displacement when you come to see me, you go, so all your people you knew are dead. But then it says that the guy was amazed at how the life had flourished on the earth and technology had increased and all this stuff. And so it's an interesting time travel story within ancient Hinduism. Um, but let me just go ahead and let me show this real quick. This is what Brahma sits on in the sky. It's the lotus. It's specifically a white and light pink lotus. This is going to be very important later as we get to the end. So just keep this in mind. Just like I talked about the fabric, uh, the the what looks like a labyrinth, but it was it was that uh, grid-like pattern that the loom was putting things on. That they get in the time machine, they see the grid-like patterns. They see all this is going to come into play. All these little symbols, all these little working ends, the double trinity, the the ohm, everything involved. It's all going to work into the end of this presentation. And just keep this in mind as you see this. You see this little picture on the left. You see this depiction on the right of Brahma, the triple-headed goddess, who's the representation of Ra to the Egyptians and Zeus to the Greeks. He, In the Indian culture, he sits in the sky on his home on this little lotus that is a peculiar shape and design that we see on the left-hand side. The lotus flower in the water lily form is a person, persistent ornament in architecture. It's a well-known example is its use in decorating the capitals of columns, a practice dating from ancient Egyptian times. The lotus is also the basis of the Assyrian sacred tree and the Phoenician stella capitals, which were the antecedent of the Ionic order of architectural design. 
In addition to architecture, excuse me, in addition to artists, artistic uses, the lotus has since ancient times symbolized fertility and related ideas, including birth, purity, sexuality, rebirth of the dead, and in astrology, the rising sun. So the occult loves this flower, just like they love the palm tree. They ascribe the palm tree to uh, Osiris. They love the lotus and ascribe it to Zeus and Ra and Hathor. And I'm going to show that here right now. In ancient Greece, at the top of the columns are the lotus. All these decorative columns that we talked about last time as the ashra, the actual knowledge, the representation of of, of the wisdom and knowledge of Mother Babylon, the Ma'at, that they inscribed in all their pillars, both in a literal on-the-nose sense as well as a metaphoric sense of their knowledge that sustained their kingdom and upheld their rulers. They put under their columns. At the top of them is the lotus. The top of their columns was the lotus. They loved it. They worshipped it in Egypt as well as India. Here is Hathor columns, like we talked about last week and several weeks now, that Hathor is a representation of Mother Babylon, the stability of the kingdom, the wisdom, power, and strength of the kingdom. It's also represented as the place of a lotus where Zeus sits in the sky. Here's some columns that have uh, that were destroyed and the heads of them that has Hathor on it. You can see in her headdress, she has lotus flowers as well as sticking out of her ears. Decoratively, she's got the lotus flower directly on her. The Assyrian sacred tree, like it said, the interior center pillar, the column of the sacred tree itself is the lotus flower. Like we talked about, this isn't a, this is a representation of the Dejed for the Assyrians. It's the pillar of the stability, which they had the raising ceremony where they would they would raise it up, wrap it in a scarf, and and a, a trip, put it next to the, the, the king's seat to represent the wisdom by which the king ruled by. It's literally a a representation in all ways. It's a it's a metaphoric representation of Mother Babylon. The wisdom, the pure doctrine the pure philosophy, the pure way of thinking that they viewed as the only way to be and think according to the Mother, ba Mother Babylon as it gave wisdom from down above from Ra, represented by the lotus. It's also a part of the Norse, Assyrian, and Hebrew Kabbalah systems. Isn't that amazing? And we see... The double double Hindu trinity is a part of, uh, this is a, a Latin depiction of hermetic alchemy, showing that um, the Shiva, the Shakti, and the Muraganu in the sky above, you've got this circular pattern. I'm, I'm transitioning here as I introduce the idea of the circle and why the circle is so important, the Ouroboros, and other, other depictions and forms of it. As you can see here, you've got the, the, uh, the angels on the outside blowing into the circle. This is the winds affecting the world. You've got the sun and moon circling overhead. You've got angels depicted in the center and at the top. This is the realms of the earth and creation as a whole. Now, the Hindu texts describe innumerable universes existing all at the same time, moving around like atoms, each with its own Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. Just take a minute to think about what we just read. The Hindu text describes innumerable universes existing all at the same time, moving around like what? Like atoms. You might say, well, I, wait a minute. That, is, that like, is that like American language? Nope. This is ancient Vedic thought. So here's some... Some quotes from some ancient uh, some ancient writings from India, from the Bhagavata Purana. It says, every universe is covered by seven layers, earth, water, fire, air, sky, that, that some translations will call it the ether, the total energy, and false ego, each ten times greater than the previous one. There are innumerable universes besides this one, and although they are unlimitedly large, they move about like atoms in you. Therefore, you are called unlimited. Now, this is speaking about Vishnu. This is like a praise to Vishnu. 
in another chapter in this same book, the Bhagavata, Bhagavata, Bhagavata Purana, it says, because you're unlimited, neither the lords of heaven nor even you yourself can ever reach the end of your glories. The countless universes, each enveloped in its shell, are compelled by the wheel of time to wander within you like particles of dust blowing about in the sky. The scrutus, following their method of eliminating everything separate from the supreme, become successful by revealing you as their final conclusion. So another concept of connecting the idea of their multi-universes, the countless universes and countless sizes, large and small, all relating to the wheel of time, relating to the Hindu Trinity. Bhagavata Purana chapter three talks about the layers or elements covering the universes are each 10 times thicker than the one before. And all the universes clustered together appear like atoms in a huge combination. This is their, their thought process, their philosophy of how the universe exists at a large, at a macro and microscopic level, the fabric of reality. Bhagavata Purana chapter 10 again says, what am I? A small creature measuring seven spans of my own hand. I'm enclosed in a pot-like universe composed of material nature, the total material energy, false ego, ether, air, water, and earth. And what is your glory? Unlimited universes pass through the pores of your body just as particles of dust pass through the openings of a screen window. Interesting, right? <laughs> oh, you mean like a you mean like a, a screen window, like like a grid like pattern of a screen window? Interesting. It goes on to say in a in a breakdown of the piranhas, just giving you the history of what we just read from. According to the Bhagavata Purana itself, it was spoken to Parakshit about 5,000 years ago and was recited and chanted by devotees up until this present day. Academics estimate the date of the composition is probably around the 6th century CE, but may be as early as the 1st century B BCE. Manuscripts survive in numerous inconsistent versions revised through the 18th century, creating various recensions both in the same languages and across different Indian languages. And now we're going to jump into really trying to tie a lot of this together. Kali, we probably have, many of us have probably heard of who Kali is, and we're going to expand, break this down a little bit more. I just want to do a quick, a quick review of some of these ideas. What we've looked at TV and culture, both in books, in print, television, film, this idea of pushing this narrative of multiverses, time travel, changing your fate, making up for bad mistakes, avoiding consequence. This, this whole concept is, is being pushed onto the public as if it was new thoughts, as if it was somehow the advancement of modern technology. But what have we already talked about all the way back to our Vestian Babylon series? What they're calling visitors from other planets with these UFOs, UAPs, it's just ancient Vimana technology from ancient India that the Romans had wrote, wrote about, that the Romans wrote about, that the Akkadians had, that the Chaldeans had, that the Egyptians had. This is There's nothing new under the sun. In the same way, technologically, religiously, as far as deception goes, but also with philosophy, with how they view creation and what they think makes up creation. There's nothing new under the sun, guys. We're going to watch a clip here in a minute where there's this, a modern guy at a TED Talk, and he's, he's trying to explain string theory, which is the multidimensional theory that's being pushed in academia right now as the dominant understanding of reality. And he's even attributing these ideas to new theories that just popped up in the 20th century. It's absolute lies. All this is repeating the ancient Brahma, the ancient Atma, the ancient Ma'at, the ancient doctrines, the vain philosophies of pagan worlds from the past, of false god worship, directly coming from Azazel himself. Kali, also referred to as Mahakali, or the Badrakali and Kalika, is a Hindu goddess who is considered to be the goddess of ultimate power, time, and destruction and change in Shaktiism. In this tradition, she's considered as a ferocious form of goddess Adi Shakti, the supreme of all powers, the ultimate reality. The ultimate reality. Power over time. Kali is the feminine form of Kala, 
as a descriptive substitute for Shiva, and thus considered the consort of Shiva. In Sanskrit, Kala means appointed time. I'll let you guys just sit with that for a minute. I'll take a drink. In Sanskrit, Kala means appointed time. So this picture here is actually uh, New York City. I think it was like 2015. Um, they they were trying to promote um, climate change agenda stuff, like you know, protect Mother Earth, and and in their effort for these activists, uh, convinced the Empire State Building to organize their lights on their building to draw a picture of Kali with their lights to promote Mother Earth. Yeah, the destructive goddess, the bloodthirsty, cannibalistic, destructive goddess. That's the representation they wanted to use to promote climate change and the protection of Mother Earth. But in Sanskrit, Kala means appointed time. Kali shares some characteristics with some ancient Near Eastern goddesses, such as drinking blood like the Egyptian goddess Sekhmet and wearing a necklace of heads and a belt of severed hands like the Levantine goddess Anat. Levantine, the Levant, Israel, the, 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 the Dead Sea area, southwest of Jerusalem, the land of the Amorites, the Phoenicians, the Canaanites, the Palestinians. Or I should say the, um, um, I can't think of the name right now. Um, whoever Goliath was from, I can't even think of the name right now. It starts with a P. Um, that, yeah, the Levant. This was their goddess. And Kali herself may have been influenced by Anat and Sekhmet. Got the, the connection from the scholar down below for everyone that may be doubting how these cultures are intimately related. Here's an actual ancient Egyptian carving. Yeah, the Philistines, thank you. Uh, my wife helped me out, the Philistines. I couldn't think of the word, the P word, some kind of P word, the Philistines. Um, so Ramesses II and Anat are actually literally in a depiction and an, an artistic carving together from ancient Egypt. Anat is characterized as warlike in Egyptian sources, similar as in the Ugarit. She was also called the Mistress of Heaven. It's been argued that this title may be related to her epithet. That's a another descriptive term of the same person known from the Ugaritic text, Mistress of the High Heavens. So just like we talked about in the past few episodes, identifying these other goddesses in Egypt, specifically Hathor and Isis, being as being a female personification to Mother Babylon. Same thing with Artemis or Diana to the Greeks, they're a female personification of Mother Babylon, and they represented her. So was this female goddess Anat, who is the the Levantine or the Middle Eastern or the you know Phoenician equivalent of Kali in ancient Hinduism. In visual arts, she was portrayed wearing the etef, a type of crown associated with Upper Egypt, and wielding either a spear and a shield and a fenestrated battle axe, or possibly the Waz scepter, though this utensil is better attested in, a search, in association with Astarte, or Astarte, to the, the Chaldeans and the Assyrians. It's all connected, guys. So in Jeremiah, when the people, Jeremiah is telling them to stop baking cakes to the Queen of Heaven, and they say, no, we're not going to do that. We want to, because whenever, and this is from last week, right? But, but they say for, for whenever we stopped worshiping the queen of heaven and started worshiping Yahweh, um, our fortune changed. Things didn't go well for us. So we're going to continue making sacrifices to the queen of heaven. So our fortune can come back. They were literally worshiping Kali. The Kali, 
It's an acronym for the Kilo Ampere Linear Injector is a linear electron accelerator being developed in India by the Defense Research and Development Organization. Uh, that's like the DARPA, the Indian DARPA version, basically. And the Baba Atomic Research Center, there's that atomic concept. It is said by many organizations and institutes to have directed energy weapon capabilities. This Kali weapon is said to be India's top secret weapon. The Kali is a particle accelerator. It emits powerful pulses of electrons. Other components in the machine down the line convert the electron's energy into electromagnetic radiation, which can be adjusted to X-ray or microwave frequencies. And this is by the Indian government. This is, this is information, as you see at the bottom, by the Indian government itself. And what did we talk about earlier when we talked about the triquetra? Not just the, th the three symbol, but any symbol in which it has the arcing around the sphere in the center. Any symbol where you have the arcing lines around the around the metal. What is the 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 picture, the, the universal symbol for atomic energy? Is the sphere with the arching points going all around it? It represents the goddess and the gods of the ancient Greek, Egyptian, and Hindu trinities that had power over time and reality itself. The and CERN, the European Organization for Nuclear Research, known as CERN. It's a, it's a international organization, or excuse me, intergovernmental organization that operates the largest particle physics laboratory in the world. Established in 1954, it's based in northwest suburb of Geneva on the France-Switzerland border. It comprises 23 member states, and Israel was admitted in 2013. It is currently the only non-European country holding full membership. CERN is an official United Nations General Assembly observer. Here's kind of an aerial view of CERN, showing you where the, the underground facility, uh, what it encompasses as far as the 17 mile odd track where they, they shoot the electrons at each other, accelerate the particles to make them explode. So let's watch a quick little presentation here on CERN. And some crazy activities happening out front of CERN. Es ist vermutlich nur ein Can't understand what's, what's being said, but this is someone captured a video and released it of some sort of weird ritual happening outside of CERN in front of the statue of Shiva. What did we just talk about? Shiva is the male version of Kali. Kali is the female avatar, the female form of Shiva standing in the wheel of time that represents this cosmic dance which represents the double trinity the ohm the essence the vibrational power that represents true knowledge and wisdom and holds the fabric of reality together this is what shiva represents who can destroy worlds and create them in an endless cycle so that there's never truly judgment this is the philosophical meanings for Shiva. The idea, and, and they're doing some kind of ritual to worship, some black robed ritual. I don't know who that was. There's no information on that clip. It just was released a few years ago. But let's look at a much, much more, um, a little bit lengthier video. I think this next one's like eight or nine minutes, but it's gonna it's gonna tie a lot of these ideas together as far as what's what does all this mean, right? Like, what what are we talking about? Are you, Sean, are you trying to say that time travel is real? No. Are you trying to say there's really multiverses? No. Okay. Are you trying to say these these ancient gods really have the power over time and, and space like that to manipulate reality? No. But that's what's being pushed on the world for thousands of years, and it's being ramped up in a different way now to bring in a, a you know, what I believe is going to lend into the greater deception leading into this 42 months where Babylon has fallen things the 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 dragon is being worshipped the first and second beast are brought back on the scene and the world is wandering after them and we'll be talking about the uh persecution of the saints next month or excuse me next uh next probably two weeks from now but before we finish tonight let's look at a few more things to tie this all together so you can see that this is absolutely 
what they've been pushing forever. We're gonna, as we watch this video, I'm gonna stop periodically to make some small comments to explain everything I've been showing you, the symbolism, the time, the, 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 everything this guy's gonna show versus everything I've shown you already. It, they're literally repackaged and repushing ancient Vedic theology that's Brahmin worship that they're going to be pushing to the world as science. In 1919, a virtually unknown German mathematician named Theodor Kaluza suggested a very bold and in some ways very bizarre idea. He proposed that our universe might actually have more than the three dimensions that we are all aware of. That is an addition. He didn't, he proposed it, but he's just reproposing it after Vedic the theology. Into left, right, back, forth, and up, down, Kaluza proposed that there might be additional dimensions of space that for some reason we don't yet see. Now, when someone makes a bold and bizarre idea, sometimes that's all it is. Bold, bizarre, but it has nothing to do with the world around us. This particular idea, however, Although we don't yet know whether it's right or wrong, and at the end I'll discuss experiments which in the next few years may tell us whether it's right or wrong. This idea has... Now remember, this is before, this is, this is 2005, so this is right when CERN is being built. Remember what we talked about from all these movies being shown to us in the 80s, like 12 Monkeys, which was a machine looking just like CERN, having to do with sending someone through time has had a major impact on physics in the last century and continues to inform a lot of cutting-edge research, so I'd like to tell you something about the story of these extra dimensions. So where do we go? To begin, we need a little bit of backstory. Go to 1907. This is a year when Einstein is basking in the glow of having discovered the special theory of relativity and decides to take on a new project, to try to understand fully the grand pervasive force of gravity. Imagine space is a substrate of all there is. Einstein said space is nice and... So does this look familiar, guys? This is about eight years before the Interstellar movie, where he goes into this three-dimensional bad-looking library that's like a, a three-dimensional labyrinth to the fifth dimension so he can try to talk to his daughter. Flat if there's no matter present, but if there is matter in the environment, such as the sun, it causes the fabric of space to warp, to curve, and that communicates the force of gravity. Even the Earth warps space around it. Now look at the moon. The moon is kept in orbit, according to these ideas, because it rolls along a valley in the curve. So this is pretty hilarious to me because like the, the whole premise of general relativity, which is what he's trying to visualize here from Einstein's theory, is that the, the gravitational body has caused space time to warp and therefore create the gravitational pull around it. And that's how they get away with gravity, which is a non-attractive force, which isn't even a real force anyway. That's how they get away with explaining the idea of gravity being an attractive force. But what's so funny is think about what we just saw, even with his animation, which is intellectually dishonest. He started out showing an actual grid pattern, three-dimensional, up, down, left, right. But then he switched it to a 2D pattern, a flat plane for these things to bend and roll on. But in <laughs> There's, there's no there's no rolling on something if you're in a three-dimensional uh, substrate that had actual matter. I mean, it's just no, it's all this nonsense. This is all thought. These are all thought experiments, theories. I want you to notice how many times this guy says theories. Curved environment that the sun and the moon and the earth can all create by virtue of their presence. If we go to a full frame view of this, the earth itself is kept in orbit because it rolls along a valley in the environment that's curved because of the sun's presence. That no, it doesn't. Is this new idea about how gravity actually. What you just saw was a, a tr 1980s Tron version representation of heliocentric sun worship. Helios worship. Really works. So Kaluza said to himself, Einstein has been able to describe gravity in terms of warps and curves in space, in fact, space and time, to be more precise. Maybe I can play the same game with the other known force, which was at that time 
known as the electromagnetic force. We know of others today, but at that time, that was the only other one people were thinking about. You know, the force responsible for electricity and magnetic attraction and so forth. So Kaluza says, maybe I can play the same game and just. You know the you know the the theory, the force responsible for everything we actually observe. Yeah, you know, electromagnetics. Uh, cracks me up how he's trying to denigrate it as some like sub subpar theory that oh there's this other force out there yeah and what was he gonna do with that one so this other guy thought well einstein's got his idea and i'm gonna what if i applied einstein's idea to my understanding of electromagnetism which was the dominant and understanding of all physics until einstein came out with his thought experiment called special or general yeah special relativity special relativity and then he had to change it later because it was it was debunked to general relativity describe electromagnetic force in terms of warps and curves that raised a question warps and curves in what einstein had already used up space and time warps and curves to describe gravity there didn't seem to be anything else to warp or curve so kaluza said well Maybe there are more dimensions of space. He said, if I want to describe one more force, maybe I need one more dimension. So he imagined that the world had four dimensions of space, not three. And imagine that electromagnetism was warps and... Listen to this carefully, guys. He imagined that it had four, not three. He imagined. Curves in that fourth dimension. Now, here's the thing. When he wrote down the equations describing warps and curves in a universe with four space dimensions, not three... He found the old equations that Einstein had already derived in three dimensions, those were for gravity, but he found one more equation because of the one more dimension. And when he looked... Yeah, it's called adding a new variable to an equation. So then you can solve for it. Like, it, it's not like he's discovering the fabric of reality. He's literally... This is why people understand math. He's literally just adding new variables into an equation, and then he has to solve for the new variable. Like, it's just... Looked at that equation, it was none other than the equation that scientists had long known to describe the electromagnetic force. Amazing. It just popped out. Now, but for those of us who are a little bit more practically minded, two questions immediately arise from his observation. Number one, if there are more dimensions of space, where are they? We don't seem to see them. And number two, does this theory really work in detail when you... No. ...try to apply it to the world around us. Now, the first question was answered in 1926 by a fellow named Oscar Klein. He suggested that dimensions might come in two varieties. There might be... He suggested they might come in two varieties. He's trying to solve a theoretical problem from a guy 10, 20 years before him, and he comes around with another theory. He suggested that it might work this way big, easy to see dimensions, but there might also be tiny curled up dimensions, curled up so small, even though they're all around us. So if we take a look, say, at space itself. So did you hear what he just said? The other guy came along later. I don't even, doesn't matter what his name is. He came along later and said, what if, what if I add a new theory to your, to your incomplete theory? I can add some more information, some more theoretical information. And what if each universe, there was, what if there was smaller electromagnetic atoms rolled up and inside of the big ones? I can only show, of course, two dimensions on a screen. Some of you guys will fix that one day. But anything that's not flat in the screen is a new... As he, as he immediately zooms into three-dimensional concept. ...dimension goes smaller, 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 and way down... So what did we just talk about? What was the story from ancient the, the ancient uh, King Ramana or whatever his name was from, from the Vedic texts? Was that uh, Hamunan or Hamunan, the monkey-faced dude, god of ancient India, could make himself smaller and smaller and smaller and go into the fabric of reality where, where he met the serpent god inside there <laughs> to get the ring of this king that he kept dropping his ring every day. What a troll. Just kept dropping his ring every day. That's He, he became Ant-Man. Just like we're seeing this animation here, like you've seen in modern Marvel movies with much better graphics, they show you the same process where he's becoming Ant-Man to go deeper and deeper into the fabric of a, a, an atom, basically. Down in the microscopic depths of space itself, this is the idea. You could have additional curled up dimensions. Here is a little shape of a circle, so small that we don't see them. But if you were a little ultra microscopic ant walking around, you could walk in the big dimensions that we all know about. That's like the grid part. But you could also access the tiny curled up dimension 
that's so small that we can't see it with the naked eye or even with any of our most refined equipment, but deeply tucked. <laughs> Did you guys hear that? That you can't see with the naked eye or even our most refinely uh, detailed equipment. You can't see, you can't observe it, you can't be measured or tested. It's fake, it's not real, it's imagined. This is CGI in poor CGI from 2005. Into the fabric of space itself, the idea is there could be more dimensions as we see there. Now, form oh, a lot of cutting edge research. I mean, some of you guys smaller, 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 and way down in the microscopic depths of space itself, this is the idea. You could have additional curled up dimensions. Here is a little shape of a circle, so small that we don't see them. But if you were a little ultra microscopic ant walking around, you could walk in the big dimensions that we all know about. That's like the grid part. But you could also access the the grid part. It's always a grid. But we talk about the loom, the interior, the time machines. Here's the grid. Here's the circles. You see the symbolism, guys? Here's the grid. Here's the circles. What does that grid look like? Like a labyrinth? Except this is one you have to imagine. You can't build and see this one. This is a labyrinth for your mind. Tiny curled up dimension that's so small that we can't see it with the naked eye or even with any of our most refined equipment, but deeply tucked into the fabric of space itself, the idea is there could be more dimensions, as we see there. Now, the idea is that there could be more dimensions. It's all theory. That's an explanation about how the universe could have more dimensions than the ones that we see. But what about the second question that I asked? Does the theory... Yes, uh, Evan in the chat saying the Higgs field was proposed as a, as a grid also. Yeah, that's... that's what they talk about with CERN and the idea of finding the Higgs boson particle, which is directly considered the God particle, which can control reality, possibly lead to other dimensions, possibly time travel. It actually work when you try to apply it to the real world. Well, it turns out that Einstein and Kluze and many others worked on trying to refine this framework and apply it to the physics of the universe as was understood at the time. Guys, let me translate that for you. Einstein and Klutz and this other guy ref worked to refine this framework of their theories. That's called Dungeons and Dragons for for scientists. Like that's like it's all thought. It's a thought game, and they're rolling the dice to see what works. It's a thought game. It's this is just. I mean, these are dudes getting paid to sit around and think, just like in ancient Greece. Where they it was their custom as we read in Acts, where Paul went into Athena to excuse me, Athens. And there was, you know, that's where Socrates used to hang out. That's where all the all the plates, that's where all the people used to hang out, just sit around and think thoughts. This I wish I had the clip set up. Um one of my favorite shows, man, is a show called Community, and it's a silly show. And 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 it's came out like 2009. And uh there's this character in there that's that's played by um Donald Glover and uh he's he plays a really dumb character you know and uh and they're all at a community college and like uh and the third season John Goodman is trying to get him to join the air conditioner repair school which is part of a different annex on the grounds of the of the community college and Troy is is the Donald Glover character and he's like I don't want to work on uh air conditioner repair I don't want to do plumbing I don't do I, I just want to sit with my friends and watch TV and think thoughts <laughs> you're just like <laughs> Yeah, this is what the ancient Greeks did. The, the, the sophists, the sophistries of the ancient Greeks, the philosophers, the vain philosophies that Paul warns you about in Colossians 2, not to be held captive and deceived by vain philosophies. These are thought experiments. These are people that can't prove, observe, test, or demonstrate anything. And they're getting millions of dollars thrown at them, just like they've never come up with a quantifiable effectual, beneficial, anything from CERN and countries are building particle accelerators at rapid speeds. They're throwing hundreds of billions of dollars to build particle accelerators in all kinds of countries on the idea of trying to find a way to control reality, which includes time. And there's a reason for this. Uh, thank you for the super chats, guys. I really appreciate that. 
<coughs> yeah, up here creations. I appreciate you, brother. Hopefully it's helping. And this this is there's a reason. There's a reason there this this is not just leading into a deception about a a fake coming alien visitor of panspermia. It's deeper than that. They want to control reality. They want to manipulate the fabric of time. Like we talked about two, two episodes ago in our cult of Saturn episode, just like they're trying to break into the communicative aspects of the ether itself, the instantaneous, all recording aspects. They also want to break into the fabric of vibration. In the beginning, God spoke and things were created. They want to break into the vav, the fabric of reality and he's going to show, he's going to go on here in a few minutes with another demonstration, a bad animation to show what they believe from what they're trying to teach, which is just a copy paste from ancient Hinduism about what's happening inside of atoms at the very core fundamental building block of reality. And in detail, it didn't work. In detail, for instance, they couldn't get the mass of the electron to work out correctly in this theory. So many people worked on it, but by the 40s, certainly by the 50s, this strange but very compelling idea of how to unify the laws of physics had gone away. Until something wonderful happened in our age. In our era, a new approach to unify the laws of physics is being pursued by physicists such as myself, many others around the world. It's called superstring theory, as you were. A new approach, which is actually just. Let me translate for you. What he's calling a new approach is he meant to say, um, he, he said it wrong. He meant to say um, a copy paste approach from ancient Hinduism about Brahma being connected by a string to Vishnu who sits on the tulip that controls reality and time connected to the goddess Kali. Like they're just using the wrong words, but they're replaying the same ancient Hindu Vedic religious philosophies. We're indicating and the wonderful thing is that superstring theory has nothing to do at first sight. Do you remember the strings that the Morai, the Greek goddesses of fate, would have the strings of a person's life that they controlled, that ultimately Zeus controlled? With this idea of extra dimensions, but when we study superstring theory, we find that it resurrects the idea in a sparkling new form. So let me resurrects it from 5,000 years ago, not from 1910. Let me just tell you how that goes. Super string theory, what is it? Well, it's a theory that tries to answer the question, what are the basic, fundamental, indivisible, uncuttable constituents making up everything in the world around us? Kind of like the essence of the absolute supreme. The idea is like this. So imagine... We look at a familiar object, just a candle in a holder, and imagine that we want to figure out what it is made of. So we go on a journey deep inside the object and examine the constituents. So deep inside, we all know you go sufficiently far down, you have atoms. We also all know that atoms are not the end of the story. They have little electrons that swarm around a central nucleus. Remember the idea of the triquetra and the arcs that swarm around the center? This is the animation you're watching for an atom with protons, electrons, and neutrons. With neutrons and protons, even the neutrons and protons have smaller particles inside of them known as quarks. That is where conventional ideas stop. Here is the new idea of string theory. Deep inside any of these particles, there is something else. The something else is this dancing filament of energy. The dancing? You mean like the cosmic dance that Shiva does inside the circle? That control, they can destroy or create reality, multiple universes. Okay, I understand now. Looks like a vibrating string. That's where the idea of string theory comes from. And just like the vibrating strings that you just saw in a cello can vibrate in different patterns, these can also vibrate in different patterns. They don't produce different. You mean like a loom that creates strings of patterns? Oh, okay, I see musical notes rather they produce the different particles making up the world around us so if these ideas are correct this is what the ultra microscopic landscape of the universe looks like it's built up of a huge number of these little tiny filaments of vibrating energy vibrating in different frequencies the different frequencies produce the different particles the different particles are responsible for all the richness in the world around us and there you see unification 
because matter particles, electrons and quarks, radiation particles, photons, gravitons, are all built up from one entity. So matter and the forces of nature all are put together under the rubric of vibrating strings, and that's what we mean by a unified theory. And here is the catch. Now, listen closely. When you study the mathematics of string theory, you find that it doesn't work in a universe that just has three dimensions of space. It doesn't work in a universe with four dimensions of space, nor five, nor six. Will it work at all? How many dimensions does it take, Bob? Let's roll the wheel. Let's, let's roll that Price is Right wheel and see how many dimensions it lands on. What's it going to take for these equations, to have these, all these theories compiled on manure theories? How, what's it going to take for them all to actually come out as a shining, gleaming reality? Finally, you can study the equations and show that it works only in a universe that has 10 dimensions of space. Oh, you mean like this? You mean like this? 10 dimensions? You mean like this? This is just, this is, it's all, it's all Gnostic Kabbalah, Hinduism, ancient Ma'at from Egypt. This is all nonsense, guys. And one dimension of time. It leads us right back to this idea of Kaluza and Klein that our world, when appropriately described, has more dimensions than the ones that we see. All theory, not proven. So when we talk about the extra dimensions in string theory, it's not one extra dimension, as in the older ideas of Kaluza and Klein. This is what string theory says about the extra dimensions. They have a very rich, intertwined geometry. This is an example of something Oh, interesting little animation here that's popping up. Uh, inside these strings, we see all oh, this interesting little animation. I wonder, I wonder why it chose this. Known as a Kalabiao shape. Name isn't. He keeps saying Kalabiao and Klutz and Klein. I think he keeps trying to say Kabbalah. All that important. But as you can see, the extra dimensions fold in on themselves and intertwine in a very interesting shape, mm. interesting structure. Interesting indeed, they, uh, these, this little animation of how this power works inside these rings, it folds in on itself and intertwines in this interesting shape and interesting structure. It's almost as if we've seen this somewhere before. I wonder, oh, there it is. We saw it with Brahma. It's literally the lotus he's sitting on. Oh, look. That's the imagery they chose for the animation. Inside the grid, inside the rings, the ohm the creative power, that's the energy they chose. The idea is that if this is what the extra dimensions look like, then the microscopic landscape of our universe all around us would look like this on the tiniest of scales. When you swing your hand, you'd be moving around these extra dimensions over and over again, but they're so small that we wouldn't know it. Strings themselves will be affected by the vibrational patterns and the geometry within which they are moving. So let me bring some strings into the story. And if you watch these little fellas vibrating around, they'll be here in a second right there, notice that the way they vibrate is affected by the geometry of the extra dimensions. This in many ways... All right, so this is what these guys are... are this is what evolutionists and theorists, mathematical theorists and philosophical theorists, this is what they're famous for doing. They introduce an idea as theory. They say that word a few times, and then the next 20 minutes, they speak of it as if it's reality. This is I saw this in my son's science books when he was in third and fourth grade as they introduced certain ideas. It's indoctrination. This, yes, he went to public school back then. It's indoctrination. This is this is absolutely how they do it. This is the sophistry trick. This is the, the trickery. This is the, the shell game with the, with the guy on the table with the ball and the cups that you pay $5 on the side of the streets in London. This is the same grift. They just basically, they say, yeah, these theories, this guy had this one theory, this other guy had this other theory. So we started investigating this and then they couldn't figure it out. So they got together and they was like, well, our theories are bunk, but what if we put them together? Maybe we could figure something out if we put our, our bunk theories together. Yeah. Yeah, yours is trash. Yours is trash. Let's put them all together and see if we can make something shiny out of all this trash. And so then they then start with animations, the cartoons, the visualizations. 
They start putting images in front of you and say, well, what if this theory looked like this? And what if that theory looked like that? And if we just tweak it enough, we can make it actually look like it does something. And then they start talking about it like it does something. This is called indoctrination, guys. Would be the first fundamental explanation for why the structure of the universe is the way it is. Now, this is very interesting. He just said, if this would work, this would be the first fundamental explanation. Fundamental. Oh, you mean like, well, how's he using that word fundamental? Is he using that like in a base level scientific sense or is this a pun? Is this, have, is this like a double entendre? Is he's using it not only in a base level scientific sense, but like a fundamental, like 5,000 years ago, ancient Hindu fundamental explanation of the, of the reality we live in. Because that's exactly what he's visualizing and literally describing. He's repeating Vedic mantras, showing visual visualizations from them, and calling it new science. You're being lied to. They're getting they're getting donation money from grants, from schools, from alumni. They're stealing people's money and they're repackaging ancient philosophy and religion, and telling you that it's scientific advancement. In CERN, Geneva, Switzerland, a machine is being built called the Large Hadron Collider. It's a machine that will send particles around a tunnel, opposite directions, near the speed of light. Every so often, those particles will be aimed at each other, so there's a head-on collision. The hope is that if the collision has enough energy, it may eject some of the debris from the collision from our dimensions, forcing it to enter into the other dimensions. How would we know it? Well, we'll measure the amount of energy after the collision, compare it to the amount of energy before, and if there's less energy after the collision, then before, this will be evidence that the energy has drifted away. And if it drifts away in the right pattern that we can calculate, this will be evidence that the extra dimensions are there. Let me show you that idea visually. So imagine we have... They got to use the big G. <laughs> ...of a certain kind of particle. It's called a graviton. That's the kind of debris we... But look at even their animation, guys. The big G in... in <laughs> In, in Freemasonry, this big G is in the orb in the sky on their tracing board artwork, representing Gad, the god of fortune, the god of fate, which is what we see as an as a ancient Phoenician god, also called Ra. Inside of a sphere, it's hard to see it from this animation, and in the interior of that sphere is that grid-like pattern. And then around it is the energy, that electricity, the power to change reality or in this little uh, minuscule scale animation to create a different alternative reality. Expect to be ejected out if the extra dimensions are real, but here's how the experiment will go. You take these particles, you slam them together, you slam them together, and if we are right, some of the energy of that collision will go into debris that flies off into these extra dimensions. So this is the kind of experiment that we'll be looking at in the next five seven to ten years or so and if this experiment bears fruit if we see that kind of particle ejected by noticing that there's less energy in our dimensions than when we began this will show that the extra dimensions are real and to me this is a really remarkable story and a remarkable opportunity going back to newton with absolute space didn't provide anything but an arena a stage in which the events of the universe take place Einstein comes along and says, well, space and time can warp and curve. That's what gravity is. And now string theory comes along and says, yes. All right. So you guys see how they're compounding on different people's unobserved theories. You know, talking about Newton, whom didn't like uh, Brahe or Kepler's geocentric animations, but decided to go with the heliocentric because he's an occultist. And then here comes another occultist, Einstein, with another thought experiment based on something that does not exist, that physicists rejected at the time. And it's only because certain crowds have promoted Einstein throughout time to push general relativity as the actual mechanism for gravity, which involves this idea of space time, which now opens the gate, opens the door for the entire Hindu theology to come through with all their descriptions and depictions. Now, if you're watching this from India, we love you. We want you to know the savior of the world, the son of God, right? We're not just trying to bash your ancestry, your culture. Look, 
I've got people in my deep ancestry that probably did not worship the creator of heaven and earth as I do today. So today I've given my heart to Christ and we ask that you would too. anyone across the world, sound my voice, worship the God of heaven and his son, the Messiah, your high priest of the covenant. He wants to give you forgiveness, atonement of sin, resurrect you to eternal life, bring you into absolute truth and not all this, 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 this thought experiments. These are, these are labyrinths. Like I said, mental labyrinths, just like we talked about in the last episode about the physical labyrinths that they would build, that there was no way out of them. Demons chased you around to torment you until you finally died. In the same way, this is a mental labyrinth. There's no way out of this. This is not a real reality. There's no fruit that's going to bear from this. It's all lies. It's all conjecture. It's all theories. It's all stagecraft to trick you into believing that a specific God has power over the actual creator of the universe. So I'm not picking on Hinduism. Like I've said emphatically throughout this video, it's all connected. The Egyptians worship this too. The Akkadians, the Phoenicians, the Babylonians, the Assyrians, the Greeks, they all worship this. This is the same idea they thought. I showed you clips from the idea of the Germanic uh, Norse people that believed in Odin and Thor. They thought they could travel to different realms with the power of the lightning, right? From the Triquetra to the Ohm. They spoke into the Ohm, the power that allowed him to travel. It's all the same symbolism in all these cultures. It's all there. So hopefully this is waking you up that yes, we can as people groups be born into a culture that has inherited lies. And in the United States and Western society, we have. We've inherited massive amounts of lies for over 100 years. He's explaining literally back from Newton. He's given you a trail, a historical chronology of the lies that we've inherited. And he's actually trying to summarize them for you quick so you can believe the new lie because they all depend on each other. Gravity, quantum mechanics, electromagnetism, all together in one package, but only if the universe has more dimensions than the ones that we see. And this is an experiment that may test for them in our lifetime. Amazing possibility. Thank you very much. All right. So there's the big carrot tease, all the ifs, all the could we's, all the possibilies, all the maybes. It's all, it's all nonsense. And even if in 10 years they come along and say, oh yeah, we've actually, uh, cause you know, they several years back, they claim they found the Higgs boson particle, the God particle. But even in the next 10 years, they, they come out with this big press release and they're like, oh, by the way, uh, one of our CERN facilities that we built in, whether it's Switzerland or China or India or wherever they built a product like accelerator. Oh yeah. We've actually tapped into another dimensional realm. And, uh, this guy showed up from that other realm. And he's, he's from a timeline that knows everything. Like they're, they're a hundred years ahead of it. They're 3000 years ahead of us. He's super smart. Uh, yeah. He came back in. A... What? Yeah. Why? But why? Okay, looks like we're back, guys. Looks like we're back. Okay. All right. So 
I was going to play another short clip from uh, from something else, but it's shouldn't be copyrighted. But let's just not mess with it. You guys, I think you're getting the point at this at this stage because we want to get into some actual scriptures, right? Like we try to do with these. We're showing you what the deceptions are. We're showing you what they're throwing at you. But now let's look at the truth. I think the truth is fascinating. The truth is what sets us free, not theories and mathematical equations that have to be augmented every 10 years, not uh, not assuming there's vibrational strings and lotus designs that are flowing through all the particles in my hand as I wave my hand in the air. None of that stuff, right? But instead, I read in Daniel 7 something peculiar about the end times and during the 42 months leading up to the, the coming of the Messiah. I see that it prophesies about the fourth kingdom, the beast who rules that kingdom. It says in Daniel 7, 23 through 25, this is what he said. The fourth beast is a fourth kingdom that will appear on the earth, different from all the other kingdoms. It will devour the whole earth, trample it down and crush it. The ten horns of the ten kings will rise from this kingdom. And after them, another king, different from the earlier ones, will rise and subdue three kings. He will speak out against the Most High and oppress the saints of the Most High intending to change the appointed times and laws. And the saints will be given into his hand for a time and times and half a time. Now we correlate this to be the equivalent of Revelation 13, where he had, the, the beast has 42 months to oppress the saints. What's he want to do? He wants to change the laws and the appointed time. Interesting, right? What was Kala? The name for Kali, the derivative of Kali was Kala, based the, the root word for, for the goddess Kali, a version of Shiva who just who controlled time and reality, the appointed time. Revelation 13, 4 and 5, as we read earlier, they worshiped the dragon, that's Brahma, that's Ra, whom the first and second beasts have authority under him, under the dragon, because the dragon had given authority to the beast, and they worshiped the beast, saying, Who's like the beast who can wage war against it? The beast was given a mouth to speak arrogant and blasphemous words and to, and to authority to act for 42 months. So our Heavenly Father tells us that many plans are in a man's heart, but the purpose of Yahweh will prevail. His purposes will prevail. So even though the beast who controls the fourth kingdom will think to change appointed times and laws, he'll think to. He doesn't actually get to. Let's look at God's calendar. Let's look at the true appointed times set in eternity. Let's look at God's calendar. 1 Enoch 72, verse 1. The book of the courses of the luminaries of the heaven, their relations of each, according to their classes, their dominion and their seasons, according to their names and places of origin, according to their months, which Uriel, the holy angel, who was with me, who was their guide, he showed me. And he showed me all their laws exactly as they are and how it is with regard to all the years of the world and unto eternity till the new creation is accomplished, which endures till eternity. We're going to read a few more from this area of Enoch. Chapter 72 through 82 of first Enoch, it goes over the creation model, the, the outlay of the, the courses of the sun and how, you know, the 364 day nature of creation, as well as the moon and the stars. And as it's introducing all this stuff at the beginning of chapter 72, it says that these are the laws exactly as they are and how it is regarded with to all the years of the world unto eternity. And then it gives you a qualifier even till the new creation is accomplished, which it endures till eternity. It's letting you know that nothing's going to change this. Even when we get to the point of the new creation, nothing's going to change this. No one has the power to change this. By the way, this Uriel angel who's showing Enoch this vision of, of how the sun, moon, and stars move in the heaven above, he's way more powerful than Azazel, who's, who's Ra, or Brahma, or Zeus. Uriel is, is way, way more powerful, right? So this is um, interesting that we have definitively the, the words of the creator telling us, um, by the way, here's how I made the sun, moon, and stars to work. It controls all the years of the world and it's not changing. They're consistent throughout eternity. Enoch 
82.4, blessed are all the righteous. That's people who do what's right, according to the Creator. Blessed are all those who walk in the way of righteousness and sin not as the sinners. In the reckoning of all their days in which the sun traverses the heaven. Now it's equating sinners and righteousness and their behaviors under the heaven in which the sun traverses. It's equating directly this idea of you are in this place that you will always see the sun, moon, and stars traversing as they do. They're never going to change. It's a consistent reality for you. This fabric of reality cannot be changed. He goes on to say, entering into the departing from the portals for 30 days with the heads of thousands of the orders of stars together with the four which are intercalated, which divide the four portions of the year, which lead them and enter them with four days. Check out the rest of, uh, we're going to read a few more verses, but try to go read all of, you know, Enoch 72 through 82 to get a good grasp on what it's saying here as a fuller context. I'm highlighting a few things here. Verses five through seven of the same chapter he goes on to say, owing to them, men shall be at fault and not reckon them in the whole reckoning of the year. Truly, men shall be at fault and not recognize them accurately, for they belong to the reckoning of the year and are truly recorded thereon forever. Not temporarily, not until another God comes along and tries to change it. Forever, not until men build vain machines that think that they control time and space. No, these will be recorded thereon forever. The recording of the year, the sun, moon, and stars move and traverse the heaven and record the year and will be recorded thereon forever. One in the first quarter, one in the third, one in the fourth, and one in the sixth. The year is complete in 364 days. The account thereof is accurate and recorded reckoning thereof exact. For the luminaries, the months and festivals, that's the appointed times, years and days has year shown and revealed to me to whom the Lord of the whole creation of the world is subjected, the hosts of heaven. Do you ever wonder why they care, the occult cares about astrology so much? And as we've talked about tonight, they they want to find out why what you know they they think that oh man there's there's these different energies that flow different times of the year in the calendar and they want to figure out if they can tap into that energy at a micro, microscopic level so that they can somehow manipulate it and create a new energy into a new reality because they don't like the fact that the one they exist in and can't leave the luminaries months festivals years and days to whom the Lord of the whole creation of the world has subjected the hosts of heavens, of, of heaven. They're all subjected to everything in creation above the firmament that we we're under and above in the layers of heaven below, or the layers of heaven above, all seven layers of the firmament that the Bible describes. Everything is subjected to the clock that the creator made. There's no avoiding it. There's no stopping it. There's no, there's no fast forward or rewind button. The clock that he made is ticking and talking until forever and also their judgment. It's a slow psychosis of raw. What we're describing tonight, guys, the mind labyrinth of the vain philosophy that they can actually control reality, the fabric of the creation to control time so that there is no stopping point, but there's an infinite loop and they can control or create, which is the, the doctrine, the Brahma of the Holy Trinity of India, is so that they can avoid what's coming to them because they're locked in here with everything else. What we're witnessing with these, with these false doctrines, these vain philosophies, is the desperate cries and throes of someone trying to work his way out of a trap that he cannot get out of because he doesn't have the power. He doesn't have the actual knowledge. He cannot create like Yahweh, like the creator of heaven and earth. He's not a creator. No matter how much Ra wants people in Egypt to sing about him being a creator God. Remember we read in uh, Babylon has fallen episode part 20, the book of the heavenly cow and how they, he taught the people a song to praise him as the creator who separated in the song that he separated from the primordial waters that created him. And now he has greater power than the waters that created him. It's poppycock. It's nonsense. The potter cannot say to the clay, oh, I'm, I'm you know, to, excuse me, the clay cannot say to the potter, um, suddenly I'm greater than you. You can't, this, this is the mind of a madman. 
This is the mind of someone who is slowly going insane because you see with every passing day, your judgment is coming closer and closer. No wonder when the 42 months begins, when Babylon is thrown down from the sky, it says that Satan, woe to the earth for Satan is full of wrath and fury. He knows his time is short. There's an appointed time for his judgment. He can't stop it. Hosea 6, verse 3. So let us know. Let us press on to know the Lord. As surely as the sun rises, he will appear. He will come to us like the rain, like the spring showers that water the earth. Just like he says in Genesis 9. Or excuse me, Genesis yeah, uh, 8. At the end of Genesis 8, I think it's 11 to 14. Springtime, wintertime, harvest, uh, seed time, harvest time, all that will, will never cease on the earth. So just like the spring showers come, just like the sun rises, Hosea is prophesying he will appear. If he said it, he's going to do it, it's going to happen. Can't stop it. It's the end announced from the beginning. It's Satan's end. It's Ra's end. It's Brahma's end announced from the beginning. Genesis 3, 14 and 15. So the Lord said to the serpent, because you've done this, cursed are you above all the livestock and every beast of the field. On all your belly you will go and, you, and dust you will eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He will crush your head. He will strike his heel. Judgment on the way. It's going to happen. Jubilees 10, 22 through 24. And the Lord, our God, said to us, Behold, they are one people, and this they begin to do. And now nothing will be withheld from them. This is at the building of the Tower of Babel. The equivalent in Genesis is Genesis chapter 11, 1 through 9. Go to, let us go down and confound their languages that they may not understand one another's speech, and they may be dispersed into cities and nations, and one purpose will no longer abide with them till the day of judgment. And the Lord has descended, and we descended with him to see the tower, the city and the tower which the children of men had built. And he confounded their language, and they no longer understood one another's speech, and they ceased then to build the city and the tower. Judgment has been announced from the garden to the days of Enoch, to the days after the flood in the Tower of Babel. Satan was there the whole time, listening every incremental step of the way. There's judgment coming for you. There's judgment coming for you. There's a day of judgment coming. He's inventing theories that makes them sound as smart as possible to garner worship and to delude himself because he knows he's been told it's unescapable, it's unavoidable. Isaiah 46, 8 through 10. Remember this and be brave. Take it to heart, you transgressors. Remember what happened long ago, for I am Yahweh, or Elohim. There is no other. I am Elohim. I am God. There's no other. There's none like me. I declare the end from the beginning. Ancient times from what is still to come. My purpose will stand, and I and all my good pleasure I will accomplish. Divine philosophy, what's being parlayed and being repackaged as modern science stands in direct opposition challenges like i showed the clip at the beginning of the teaser there's this there's this there's this show on netflix called dark um that that came out like in 2019 or whatever and it's about time travel and they use the quattretra and they use all the symbols that i've been showing today and there's uh and it's 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 everything that i've been showing today packaged into this little series on Netflix called dark about this German town next to a, a radioactive nuclear power plant. Cause they need the energy for time travel. Um, and there's the old man <clears throat> in the story. That's the puppet master. And he's the one at the beginning of that clip that I showed where he says, we've uh, we've we're warring against God and we're warring against time. We want to build a world without time and without God because they know judgment's coming and that little tv series just like all the movies that i showed you the purpose for the time travel is to avoid the bad consequence in the future or the bad judgment coming in the future it's all about avoiding god's judgment isaiah i'm sorry isaiah 46 12 through 13 says listen to me you stubborn people far removed from righteousness i am bringing my righteousness near it's not far away 
my salvation will not be delayed. I will grant salvation to Zion and adorn Israel with my splendor. If you're the enemy, if you're if you're a rebellious angel and you hear Isaiah the prophet speaking these words of the Lord, you think you might, you know, consistently. This is Isaiah's time now. We, we got the promise of the kingdoms being spoken in Exodus 15 in the days of Noah, or excuse me, the days of Moses. You got Noah, who was actually alive in the days of Enoch, even. Um, um, hearing the, the prophecies of Enoch about the coming judgment. You literally got some of the books of Noah mixed in with the with the writings of first Enoch in the compilation we still have today. Systematically, all throughout history, you're seeing over and over again the promises of Yahweh. I'm coming. I'm coming. I'm going to judge you guys for what you're doing. I'm coming. Systematically, these prophecies come true all throughout history. In the days of Noah, prophesied the flood came true. The days of Abraham, he prophesied the people would go into Israel. Genesis, I think, 12, 15. They would be um, oppressed for 400 years, and then Yahweh would bring them out with a mighty hand. Not only did that happen, but in my opinion, um, Zeus had to watch it from Mount Safan, watching them cross the Red Sea, watching powerlessly as Yahweh removed his people in the Passover Exodus. In the appointed time, he removed his people and saved them in the face of Azazel, of Zeus, who's powerless to do nothing. Every step of the way, Satan thinks he's got people, thinks he's, thinks he's got good control over the nations. And then here comes another prophet saying, no, you don't. God's continually to tell you his message hasn't changed. He and his son are going to come down and live on the earth. The kingdom come. The message hasn't changed. Nothing's stopping the judgment that's coming. Satan tries to kill that prophet. Jesus comes saying the same thing, the gospel of the kingdom. I go to a place to pray with my father. If we're not so, what I told you, if I if I go to that place, I'm going to come back and retrieve you. He's going to bring the kingdom. The kingdom come. He offers Yeshua the kingdoms of the world. That doesn't take. He tries to kill Yeshua. He tries to kill all the apostles. They say the same thing. Here comes another prophet, John the Apostle, speaking in Revelation. He says the same thing. Kingdom's coming. Revelation 11, seventh trumpet's being blown. He's going to start his kingdom on the earth at that point. 42 months before that, when the first trumpets start to be blown, Babylon's thrown down. Satan's seeing physical judgment starting to happen on him directly, not the kingdoms of the earth that he's manipulated to serve him. His home directly, his lotus flower is going to be squashed and thrown to the ground. No, everyone's going to see he doesn't have the power to change time or space. He can't even keep his, his vamana in the air. He's got 42 months. His wrath is going to be furious. This is why, in my opinion, he oversteps the line and gets the people to start worshiping with the first beast and the help of the second beast. Brings back the ancient Trinity pantheon that ruled over the nations, still rules over the nations in the occult, but in the open, out in the public, on TV, on everyone's phones, or whatever devices we have at that time, the whole world's going to see this is the, the gods that we're told to worship and respect. They got all these law changes for us, and some nations aren't going for it, so they're going to attack them and chaos for 42 months. He's he steps, he's uh he's unhinged. This has been a slow boil of the inevitable that he cannot stop. It's the coming judgment. First Enoch 1, 1 through 2. The words of the blessing of Enoch, wherewith he blessed the elect and the righteous who will be living in the day of tribulation when all the wicked and godless are to be removed. Seems pretty clear to me. Time qualifier, the day of tribulation, that's that 42 months that the beast has given authority to oppress the saints. The same one that thinks to change appointed times and laws. That's at the end of that is when the wicked and godless are to be removed. He took up the parable and said, Enoch, a righteous man whose eyes were opened by God, saw the vision of the Holy One in the heavens, which the angel showed me. And from them, I heard everything. And from them, I understood as I saw, but not for this generation, but for a remote one, which is to come. Concerning the elect, I said and took up my parable concerning them. The Holy Great One will come forth from his dwelling. and The eternal God will tread upon the earth, even on Mount Sinai, and appear from his camp and appear in the strength of his might from the heaven of heavens. And he shall, shall be smitten in the fear, and the watchers shall quake 
Great fear and trembling shall seize them unto the ends of the earth. Think about how much money is wasted, how much theft is being stolen through the nations to go into programs like this that cannot do anything to stave off this day that they don't that they don't want to happen. They're Amos 2 9, right? Though they may dig into the to Sheol, though they may ascend to the heaven, from there my hand will take them. He always says, there's nowhere to run in this creation model. You can live in the sky, in your O'Neill colony. You can dig a, a dumb, a D-U-M-B deep underground military base and try to stay off out there. I'm going to grab you. I'm going to come get you. There's nowhere to run. Think about that slow boil. Even back all the way back to the days of Enoch, who literally reprimanded the rebellious watchers for their behavior. He got it. He got that prophesied to him very early on. Yeah, there's going to be a time when I'm going to throw you in a pit in the ground, then I'm going to throw you in the lake of fire. Your judgment's coming. This is his fear has been slow boiling and building for thousands of years. So, of course, he's going to convince and deceive the nations to, with mass, mass theft, to go on all these thought experiments, these mental labyrinths to create all these programs to try to figure a way out. First Enoch 1, 6 through 7, and the high mountains shall be shaken, the high hills shall be made low and shall melt like wax before the flame and the earth shall be wholly rent and sunder and all that is upon the earth shall perish and there shall be a judgment upon all men. This is a judgment that's coming. Matthew 24, 36 through 42 and here's the kicker. No one knows about the day or the hour that he, not even the angels in heaven, definitely not the rebellious angel on the earth, not the son, but only the father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it'll be at the coming of the son of man. In the days of the flood, people were eating and drinking and marrying and given in marriage, but up to the day Noah entered the ark. They were all oblivious until the flood came and swept them all away. So it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Two will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken, and the other left. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day on which your Lord will come. Interesting, huh? Psalm 102, 12 through 16. But you, O Yahweh, sit enthroned forever. Your renown endures to all generations. You will rise up and have compassion on Zion. That word rise up in the Hebrew, that's a military term in the Hebrew. You will rise up and have compassion on Zion. For it is time to come show her favor. The appointed time has come. For your servants delight in her stones and take pity on her dust, so the nation will fear the name of Yahweh, and all the kings of the earth will fear your glory. Not Ra, not Brahma, not Zeus, not world economic council or the whatever economic forum or the none of that stuff not the united nations they're going to fear yahweh he's going to come down with this house and they're going to they're going to reverence him and respect him the ones that are spared anyway for yahweh will rebuild zion he has appeared in his glory there's an appointed time for him to to show up to bring zion to restore order on the earth Jeremiah 31, 7 through 12. We've talked about the appointed time of judgment. Now let's look at the blessing of another appointed time at the judgment. Jeremiah 31, 7 through 12, and you only find this in the Septuagint. For this, says the Lord to Jacob, rejoice and exult over the head of the nations. Make proclamations and praise. Say, the Lord has delivered his people, the remnant of Israel. Behold, I'll bring them from the north and will gather them from the end of the earth to the feast of the Passover. Guys, this is an appointed time. The feast of the Passover. Now, I'm not saying he's coming back directly on the day of the Passover. It says no one knows the day or the hour. It could come a week before, it come a few days before, who knows? But we're going to be gathered to celebrate the Passover. That would lead me to believe that, uh, according to the biblical calendar, that the 42 months should start approximately October ish. Just a guess. He goes on to say, The people shall beget a great multitude, and they shall return here. They went forth with weeping. I will bring them back with consolation, causing them to lodge by the channels of waters in a straight way. 
and they shall not err in it. For I have become a father to Israel and Ephraim is my firstborn. Here are the words of the Lord nations and proclaim them to the islands afar off. Say, he that scattered Israel will also gather him and keep him as one that feeds the flock. For the Lord has ransomed Jacob. He has rescued him out of the hand of them that were stronger than he. They shall come and shall rejoice in the mounts of Zion and shall come to the good things of the Lord. Even to the land of corn and wine and fruits and cattle and sheep, their souls shall be as a fruitful tree and they shall hunger no more. The Father has appointed times. The Father controls the sun, moon, and stars, and the fabric of space, and the vibration of all creation. The Father is going to judge these wicked rulers, angels and men, and remove them from the earth and bring his house down to create peace. And specifically, so that his appointed times can be observed. We see that not just in Jeremiah, but in Ezekiel and Isaiah and Matthew and Luke. The eternal instructions of the Father include not just the creation that was made eternal, and it's not going to be changed, but also his appointed times as well. So these false demonic gods can try to steal, can try to call themselves literally a god after a word that the Father venerates, like appointed times. But they have no power. They're just posers. They're con men. They're shifting the ball around with their little circular circles, trying to get you to look at this distraction over here and think about that over there. They're scheming desperately, trying to find a way out. There's no way out. It's their psychosis that they impose onto the nations. Guys, I hope you enjoyed this. I'm sorry for the, for the, um, I, I'm sorry for, um, you know, apparently not gauging correctly what uh, YouTube was going to do with some of these clips. But I think as you're watching this later, you'll YouTube automatically cuts out the moments where they pause the stream and then they just splice together. I think it's like an automatic thing they do. So uh, these are set with Rumble to be automatically uploaded to Rumble. So they'll upload, I think it's 24 hours later, they're uploaded to Rumble. But yeah, guys, it's um, hopefully this is a blessing to you. Hopefully it's as we, we delved a little deeper from the labyrinth last week into now this impossible spell, which is revealing the, the uh, insane aspirations of Ra, of Satan, of Azazel, who wants to control time. He wants to change his fate. He claims to be the god of fate, which he's not. And hopefully, by the way, the word spell in the title is like a pun. It's it not only is it, it his attempt at magic, right, to fool people that this is even possible, but it's also a synonym for the span of time. What he wants is an impossible span of time. He wants an impossible spell. He doesn't actually have the magic to pull this one off. But he wants you to think he does. It's the magic of illusion. But he doesn't have the actual magic of this power. It's his impossible spell. It's his delusion, his psychosis that we're witnessing. So I want to encourage you guys. You have a Heavenly Father that loves you. If you don't know who he is, ask him to come into you. Ask him to make himself real to you, to reveal his son to you. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be the, be the best thing you've ever done, I promise. Moderators, thank you for being here. Everyone in the live chat, thank you for being patient with us if you're still here. Um, we're here over three hours, so we're going to end. We really appreciate you guys, and we hope to see you uh Next time, where we talk about the the beast versus the brave, or I should say the brave versus the beast, um, where we'll be talking about the the two witnesses, persecution of the saints. Have a good night, guys. Thank you.